Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 32nd edition of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. We are uh, very happy today to have Catherine back with us. Um, Car Karen Stewart is here, uh, and also Millicent Black. And um, we are here today to, uh, in particular to talk about a very um, momentous thing that's happened that I think I've everybody probably who's watching this might know about already. Uh, it's about Melanie Richen, the um, fifth member of our team, who recently delivered a beautiful baby girl, um, Amethyst Richen, in um, Brussels, Belgium last week. But pretty much one day after the birth, her baby was taken away from her, and she was charged wrongfully with being uh, delusional and um, you know mentally unstable and so forth the latest news i've been trying to cover this um, thanks to regular updates from dr catherine horton who has been calling us from uh, brussels uh, from melanie's apartment to give us the information and um, the latest information there is that um, there was a court hearing on Wednesday and Melanie Richen has been released, but the baby, unfortunately, is still being held rather inexplicably in the hospital. And I think Catherine has a great deal more information to share with us today and she will um, start us off and to talk about it. I should apologize for this cover that you see over here, the Reflectix. It's over my computer because my computer is being incredibly messed with this morning and um, I'm so afraid it will all um, go, we'll go off air. So I'm trying to shield as much as possible so external signals don't affect and you know the audio in particular isn't tampered with um, but these are the conditions under which we are living and working so as Karen just told me recently it's okay I don't have to take it out just let people see this is what's going on unfortunately this is the reality it's not a setup I'm doing it to protect this podcast so that it continues as we hope so on which note, um, I guess I'll turn over the floor to, to Catherine and she can, um, you know, really update us on what's going on with Melanie and possibly Melanie may join us later. Is that correct, Catherine? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So hello, everyone. And um, my apologies for not being there um, the last two times. So the last time I actually planned to be there, but was overtaken by this complete uh, in, insane emergency when they took away Melanie's baby last Thursday exactly one hour before the um, Techno Crime Fighters Forum started and um, they had taken away the baby and it took us ages to even figure out what the allegations were and in the end um, after a lot of back and forth with the hospital and a lot of changing of stories it condensed down to a claim that um, so I, I should say the sequence of events I left um, so I was I attended the birth by cesarean section I was there to um, support Melanie and her baby and especially keep an eye on the baby um, for obvious reasons because Melanie is a, a victim of illegal human implantation so we wanted to make sure that you know she uh, her baby is fine and um, so I went I talked to midwife um, during the birth um, people were very interested why I'm there not a father of the child why I was there because I don't even live in Belgium I don't even speak French not very well and um, I felt I had to I was actually interrogated and I felt I had to explain myself so I mentioned that Melanie and I we are colleagues and they wanted to know what we're working and I said well I'm leading an international team and Melanie has a human rights organization and it went from there so I was talking to a midwife who later on identified herself as Elaine and she is absolutely key in this entire story because um, in the end, um, so uh, what, what actually happened also is that um, when the baby was taken um, to afterwards to, um, to be measured and so on and have a vitamin injection, um, you know, I was also asked what our group does and so on and I just explained and again in detail. And eventually I said, well, you know, um, I was also the person who um, analyzed something that was taken out of Melanie's throat in Switzerland in a specialist lab and it turned out to be um, an actual implant. It turned out to be synthetic material. So these are all facts, and we've reported about them for absolutely weeks and weeks live on YouTube. We have the um, everything that we're saying is backed up. We even publicly showed the scientific results that we obtained. You know, this implant contains titanium fiber. These are facts. You know, Melanie has also measured other implants in her body. We actually just got very bad feedback. Um, I'm not sure whose microphone isn't. Um, muted but um 
uh, also, it's widely known that Melanie and I were setting up professional measurements at the Belgian University so that people can measure the emissions from the implants and find the implants in their body. We are working with professors here in Belgium, with scientists to actually try to find the implants. So the fact that Melanie has implants and that I have implants is now so beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's a fact, a fact that cannot be put into question, especially not by doctors and most especially not by psychiatrists who don't even understand the basic physics. So this is the situation and I had just said, well, you know, um, I was the person who took personally something that was taken out of Melanie's throat and I had it analyzed at a lab. And then she says, oh, so it was an implant. And I said, yes. And she said, so what type of implants um, exist and where are they? And I said, well, you know, it's called the body area network. Apparently people are implanted on the head, back of the head, you know, in the limbs and very symmetric sort of pattern. And then I said, some victims also have chip implants in their ears that almost act like, you know, implanted little headphones through which they have radio communication and the, um, you know, the criminals who did that to them can then speak and then these people will hear voices. So as if they had a headphone in and a lot of people are um, abused that way. They are told things like, we're going to kill you. You're going to have a car accident. You're going to get cancer, that sort of stuff. So it's nonstop abuse with these um, implants. And this is what I'd said. I was talking in the most, apart from mentioning that I'd actually personally analyzed an implant from Melanie's throat, apart from that fact, I was entirely talking in general terms about my work here with the investigative team, with the joint investigation team. And everything I said is a well-documented fact that is now public knowledge. So that was that. And um, it was a very friendly conversation with the midwife. She was super interested. So I gave her the, you know, the website for the joint investigation team and Melanie's human rights organization and my personal website. And I said, look, these are all facts. They're all publicly documented. We have a team. We are running this criminal investigation because of the implants. So that was that. And this was, I remind you, a conversation I had with a midwife, okay? So the level of training of a midwife, okay? But um, Melanie, throughout this entire conversation, was actually mostly asleep. I mean, she was conscious, but she was absolutely exhausted. And of course, she was lying in a hospital bed. And most of the conversation, I was even in a different part of the hospital because they'd taken the baby and I was walking with the baby and I was there to supervise the baby and make sure it safely returned to Melanie. So this entire conversation took place so that M Melanie wasn't even in the room, right? So Melanie had nothing to do with this entire conversation. Yet what happened is the next day, I got a, a phone call from Melanie and they said, uh, and she said, they are now taking me for a psychiatric assessment. So what, what have you said? And I said, I didn't say anything about you. And what is all this about? I mean, the most important thing is you haven't said anything because you weren't conscious. So what's this about? So at 11 o'clock, um, and this is, you know, she gave birth at 4.30 um, the day before, okay? So in, at 11 o'clock the next morning, she had a so-called psychiatric assessment lasting less than 15 minutes with Dr. Del Haye of Hospital Erasmus. And then at, I think, 3.30, she had another interview with three pedo psychiatrists that lasted something like 20 minutes, so a bit longer than the first interview, but not much. And it concluded with them taking the baby away, having concluded that she's so delusional that they have to take away the baby urgently. Um, and so Melanie called me in a panic, and we arrived, I think, something like 5 or 6 o'clock at night because we had to get through all the Brussels traffic and so on. So we arrived in the hospital, and I went straight to reception, and I said, I'm the accompanying person, the registered accompanying person to Melanie. Can you please tell me what happened, that the baby was taken away? And the gynecologist at the maternity ward in charge of Melanie came to me smiling, and she said, Melanie, want, Melanie requested that she wants to be put into psychiatry. And I just looked at her and I said, I don't think this can possibly be true. So there was another witness with me and I said, can you please repeat this? <laughs> Thinking in front of the witness, now slowly, on call une fois. And she says, yes, Melanie requested to be put into psychiatric care. And I said, now that's very interesting. Why don't we just walk down 10 meters to Melanie's room 
and actually ask her herself if this is true. So the woman was extremely reluctant at first, but I insisted and I said, I'm sorry, this is an outrageous statement. Can we please just check with Melanie? So eventually, after being, you know, after insisting, we went to the hospital room. I went in and I said, Melanie, did you request to be put into psychiatry? And she says, no, I was coerced. They just marched in here and they said, you either come, you either go there voluntarily or we're going to force you with a court order. Now, what would you do if you, they say something like that? And this is less than 24 hours after having given birth by cesarean section. I think in that time period, everybody should leave you the hell alone to recover instead of putting you through two so-called psychiatric assessments that in the end today, or rather yesterday, turned out to be completely false. So I can safely say that everybody who interviewed Melanie and came to this conclusion is incompetent. But given the gravity of what followed and the insanity, I would even call it criminally incompetent. Just like in the Frederick LaRoche case, these people, I believe, are criminally incompetent. So the harm that followed out of their incompetence was enormous because, so when I, um, when I asked Melanie, excuse me, I mean, you haven't said that, you were coerced. And I said, I said to um, Dr. Dalmans, this sounds like she's been coerced. So what exactly happened? And I got to know about these two psychiatric assessments. And I said, fine, can you please list the points of concern that led to her being separated from her baby less than 24 hours after the birth? And she couldn't tell me. So she went out and I said, I want to know all the names of the people who have been involved in this decision. And I want to know the exact reasons that led up to this decision. And I took out the pad and I said, I'm writing everything down because we are going to a lawyer right now, we need all the names, so please tell us. So she suddenly couldn't remember, you know, why. I mean, when the, when the head doctor can't remember why a baby has been taken away of one of the patients in the care and can't work it out, she can't just go to a file and, and have a look at the report or something, she literally has had no idea. So what happened is that she assembled an entire group of people that consisted of herself, some young psychiatrist who looked like she was 22 or 23. And that's another thing about Hospital Erasmus. It's a university clinic. So pretty much everybody we dealt with looked like they were undergraduates or just finished undergraduates. So, but nevertheless, breathtakingly arrogant and so sure of their decisions that it, it really took my breath away. You know, so anyway, and an entire team assembled, and this is crucial, because the team consisted of two gynecologists, um, a psychiatrist on shift called Dr. Frederick Milsant, right? It, it, which is just very ironic, right? Frederick Milsant, it was a name I could so easily remember. Um, so that guy turned up um, and then there were two nurses. And one nurse I think was a witness to the, um, uh, the point when the baby was taken away. And I think that the other nurse, she was older and I think she must've been the head nurse in charge. So these were the people there. And I said again to the entire group, I said, can you please, first of all, give me all the names of the people who have been, you know, who, who did the psychiatric assessments and what were the points of concern that led to the fact that the baby was taken away? No one could tell me. So I said, please, can you just remember the names? I mean, this must have been, we're talking at six o'clock and what happened was at four o'clock. So it must have been the, the previous shift and these people hand over the cases. So if you don't know, you can probably go to a shift list and figure out who's been just there on the station in charge, um, you know, <laughs> and figure out who it could have been. Okay, but they couldn't, so that was interesting. So in the end, I knew from, um, from Melanie herself that the first doctor, the first psychiatrist she spoke to was Dr. Del Haye. So I jumped their memory and I said, from Melanie, I think it was Dr. Del Haye, who actually had the first meeting. And they said, mm, yeah, okay, it could be, okay. And I said, who were the three pedo psychiatrists? And no one could tell me. And I said, what were the points of concern? And then eventually, the, a nurse, I think a nurse called um, Miss uh, Lamia, she said, well, I was, uh, I was present when they took the baby. And I think they said that Melanie had said to the night nurse after I left at nine o'clock 
that Melanie said that she was hearing voices and the voices told her that they're going to take the baby away. Now, this was such an outrageous story and I knew that Melanie would first of all never say that, right? So Melanie was sitting next to me and I, I turned to her and I said, Melanie, is this true? And she said, no, with the nurse, I just talked about what you talk about after birth, like breastfeeding and medical details, nothing like that. So I said, this is very interesting. Can you please find out who the nurse was who made that claim? So Miss Lamia wasn't actually present. She didn't know which nurse it was. So she said, well, I will try to find out, but I'm not sure, you know? And then I turned to the other group, to the psychiatrist especially, and I said, can you tell me, apart from this fact that is now actually being denied, what else was there? And then suddenly the psychiatrist said, oh yes, but she also said stuff like, oh, she's got um, an implant in her throat and that people were breaking into her home. And I said, but those two facts are, are already established by evidence. I said to Dr. Frederick Nelson, I was the person who analyzed the object that was in her throat. And I am telling you that my results were that this was synthetic material, ergo, an implant. Titanium fibers containing implant, right? It's not biological matter. And I said, that is true. And as regards the um, neighbor, uh, the break-ins, I happen to know that Melanie has two written statements by neighbors who saw the burglars, who saw the intruders, and one even questioned them, right? And we have these written statements. So I said, well, that is all nonsense. So all we have to go by is hearsay evidence by a night nurse no one can identify. Isn't that strange? And you have to all take this in because it's like, you know, the gynecology unit watched how a baby is taken away, a newborn baby from a young mother less than 24 hours after the birth. This is some of the most traumatic thing that you can do to a new mother, short of actually killing the baby in front of it, right? So it's pretty traumatic. How come none of the medical staff who have a medical concern for Melanie's well-being, apparently, didn't think it odd or didn't think to collect the information to maybe question it? You know, and how come yeah. this whole time? I just wanted to stress that point, Catherine. I'm glad you sort of bring that up as a special point because we're talking about a medical institution, a hospital, which is supposed to care for the health and well-being of the people who walk through its doors, you know, who are known as patients. And they are doctors who are supposed to take care of patients. And you have a woman here who has just given birth. And I did not know that little detail, by the way, that this was within 24 hours. Um, yeah. I had thought it was more than 24 hours, but it sounds like it was 24 hours had not even passed before this uh, traumatic incident occurred where they started to drag her off for a psychiatric assessment and then took the baby away. Or maybe they, did, they took the baby away first in the morning and then no, no, they took no. the assessment. Um, it was, um, it, there were two assessments, so-called assessments. I'll co make them so-called because the first one was 50, less than 15 minutes. The second one was about 20, 25 at most. And by the end of that, the three pedo psychiatrist, sorry, I just hear echo. Um, I, it was already, sorry, it's really bad on my, on my end. Um, so I think by the end of the second so-called psychiatric assessment, it was clear that they were going to take the baby away. And I think the baby was taken at roughly something like at the, um, you know, just before four o'clock, four o'clock. And she had given birth, the, you know, the day before at 4.30. So the decision had already been taken less than 24 hours. So, and, and it doesn't they, stop there. They subjected her to the trauma of that psychiatric assessment before 24 hours had passed, yes. right? If it was 11.30 in the morning that they did that first assessment and then a little bit after lunch, possibly they did the second one. So here you have a new mother who's delivered by cesarean, who's still recovering, who's probably on drugs, right? Some kind of painkillers? Absolutely antibiotics or whatever they give them, I don't know, after cesarean. And um, and yet she's being dragged off for a psychiatric assessment and then at four o'clock she's told uh, her baby's being taken away from her. That's dream trauma. Is that not Millicent? You know, Millicent has a background in this area, so uh, perhaps she can give us an expert opinion. I can see Melissa's, um... okay. Yeah, I keep having help with everything. Uh, I, I can't send you a, a, a chat 
the whole thing. But yes, that is indeed trauma to her. In fact, I very a a district attorney, uh, an assistant district attorney, about the validity of doing anything with a person who has had any kind of anesthesia or uh, sedatives in 24 hours, and and he, he said it's a no-brainer. Absolutely, I, I so think the trauma. Essentially, she did not have a choice. The fact that they knew that she was in a compromised position. Killers from any kind of sedative that they would have given her, they probably gave her something, at least the common, common nerve, even if she was awake. A double whammy in terms of, of drugs that would have, have reduced her. See, I think, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Actually, sorry, Karen. You, oh, you it's just, yeah, I just was going to mention, it sounds like they decided ahead of time and then went on a fishing expedition, didn't get what they right. wanted, so they just lied. Period. I think that's exactly right. And, and the things that unfolded, um, I have to say, the, the, our, or especially my current best assessment, is that this was one big setup, and this was a very well-planned, very swiftly executed, psychological warfare operation that had all the hallmarks of intel written all over it because it had literally interrogation subtle interrogations by people of um using people you're meant to trust like midwives so putting people in as Millicent said you know putting people in our midst who we are likely to trust and then using that as warfare as, as a weapon against you and then those people turning your word and then, then, you know, and not just that, they turn your words. Then when you're trying to correct your words and put it right, you're not listened to, you're ignored. And then the other thing that's also typical intel in my books is that it's just, um, you know, from an absolute piffling nothing, this like, you know, explosive escalation. It's just like, wham, and then this leads to that, bam, and then bam, and it just keeps going, you know, like a chain detonation. And this is what it was because to any reasonable person, if a woman says something like that, your first step should be you go there when she had time to recover and you question her after maybe 24 hours or 48 hours after the birth and keep assessing, like, does she still say that? Was it like something she hallucinated this because of the drugs, right? Or because of the fact that she was in a fog after the birth or maybe people misunderstood? How well do you trust your staff? You know, how well do you trust the hearsay evidence from a nurse whose training is not necessarily very high? You know, where exactly you, you put your trust and do you do any fact checking? So this is, this is actually key in the assessment of the schools because when this entire group was assembled, including the head gynecologist and the psychiatrist on shift, I said, Here's a point of correction. Everything about the implant is true. And I can personally, with my expertise, say that this is true because I did the analysis as well. I was there in the Swiss lab. So that much is true. About the break-ins, we have already written statements. So those two things are off the table. What else do you have? And all they had was hearsay evidence. Now, I said it to the face of Frederick Milson and to the face of Dr. Dalmans, who was the most senior gynecologist. And this was literally as soon as we came in. So I was correcting my statements or correcting. I didn't have anything to correct. I just said, you know, this is how it is, you know. Um, and then at that stage, when I was there, able to confront everybody, the story was that Melanie had said something to the night nurse. So Melanie and I, we spent the entire rest of the time talking about the fact that, you know, Melanie had never said such a thing to the nurse. And that was literally everything we talked about for the rest of Thursday. However, as soon as this panel meeting was over, as I said, there was another witness with me, a good friend of Melanie's. And as soon as the panel meeting was over, they went out. And this is also very interesting. We were on the maternity ward at that time. And Frederick Milson, who's an assistant doctor of the psychiatric ward somewhere else, came back and he said to the other person, the visiting times are over, you have to go now. 
but it was literally five minutes before the visiting time was over. So he was like, have this person removed? He didn't come back like 10, 10 minutes after the visiting time. No, it was top priority to remove this person. And I said to Frederick Milson, literally I stared him in the eye and I said, you're removing a witness, aren't you? And he said nothing, but I said, you are removing a witness, aren't you? Because he came five minutes and I was with a big clock opposite Melanie's bed. And I thought there's still five minutes of visiting time. So you're very keen. You're very keen on such a triviality, you know? So that person was removed. Then suddenly, um, Frederick Milson came back with, um, I, but I was informed with one of the pedopsychiatrists who'd been at the other meeting, and that was Dr. Maya Sombot. Very interesting because his surname just happens to be Hungarian. One of these really amazing coincidences, it means Saturday in Hungarian, Sombot. So Dr. Maya Sombot came back with Dr. Frederick Milson. Okay. <laughs> And so I have no problems remembering these names, right? So these two people were there. And I said again to the pedopsychiatrist and Dr. Frederick Milson, I said, what were the points of concern in your meeting that, you know, you took the baby away? And then again, they said, oh, yes, Melanie keeps talking about implants and an implant in her throat and that people come to a break into her home. And I said, but that is true. We have the evidence. And again, I repeated, I have the evidence. And I said, please, can you give me the names of the other pedopsychiatrists who were at the meeting? And then they completely ignored me. And I said again, please, I need the names because we want to contact a lawyer and we need the statement of what's happening. Can you give me the names? And I said to this, uh, who later I found out is Dr. Sombat, I said, what is your name? And then she, she just ignored me. And I said, I'm very sorry, but I really need your name now because you were one of the witnesses leading up to this. And this will now be actually, you know, cleared one way or another. But we need to be we need to be able to refer to your statements. So we need to have your points of concern to make counter statements. I mean, this goes without saying, right? If you want to clear a situation. So and then, but really, she was totally cool as a cucumber standing there like that. And when I said, please, can you please give me the names? She just stood there and she says, oh, this is very threatening. I think we're going to call the police. And with that, she marched out. But in this super calm tone, I thought, well, you don't seem to be very threatened, honestly. Like, what are you threatened by? By me asking for the names? And Melanie said, but she's just doing what's required by the lawyer. You know, she didn't you know, just... Uh, that point where she says she's going to call the police is remarkable yes. because it suggests it suggests that a doctor now she's a doctor in a hospital that's what she is she's a doctor in a hospital she's a psychiatrist in a hospital but you know she's a psychiatrist because she's a doctor that's why she's employed there she's a caregiver she's a health caregiver in a hospital her job is to give health care to the patients and perhaps to speak professionally with the patient's guests. And in the process of this conversation with you, a patient's guest, she suddenly decides she's going to call the police, which to me suggests that there is perhaps a pre-established connection between psychiatrists and hospitals and the, and the police. There is a pre-established understanding that psychiatrists can call police. So that connection, I think, needs to be stressed. That psychiatry is leaning on law enforcement to get their authority established in the hospital. And we need to talk much further about the authority, the wrongful authority being appropriated by psychiatrists in hospitals and leveled against patients. But, you know, that's an important point to, to actually stress. I'm so glad you brought it up. And who in the world ever said that a doctor may keep his or her identity secret? Oh, I'm going to operate on you, but right. you don't get to know what my name is. Oh, there was a mistake in your surgery? Sorry, we can't tell you who the surgeon was. That doesn't make any sense. You practice medicine and you have a name tag. And if somebody says, what's your name? You give it right. because that's part of your job. So that's ludicrous to say, and oh, you asked me my, my name, I'm threatened. 
Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's all I did. I didn't even come close to her. There was an entire like desk between me where I had my writing pad. I was standing. Melanie was in the hospital bed next to me. I was standing there, and you know we were just talking to two people. Plus, there was a young male again, something like twenty-three year old looking. You know, so a woman threatening another woman. You know, surely the young male, energetic, dynamic, twenty-three-year-old guy could have protected her, had you know, like physical well-being being under threat. So this is nonsense. You know, utter nonsense. Catherine, Catherine, if Melanie wants to sue the hospital, though, those are a couple of points you definitely want to write down. First of all, that they would have medical staff in the hospital without name badges, because that's for the protection of the patient. The second thing is that. They would not were not uh, recognizing you as, as Melanie's companion. So what's the hospital's protocol on someone having a sitter? Because that's the same thing. And I know um, when my mom was in the hospital, she was having some problems at night. And so the hospital told my sister-in-law, either you or, or some of the family comes out to stay with her, or we're going to hire a sitter. But with hiring the sister would have meant that the family would have had to pay for it. So you need to find out what's the hospital's policy on having a sitter. And you can say then that you were there to express a request and they would be care. Actually paid for nurse at a nursing home. So that should have been her right. Um, this is it's just so wild. I did have surgery in 1995 uh, on my hand. This report, and I shared it with her several times. Uh, the doctor came in, the anesthesiologist came in, and introduced himself as Michael Sutton. The name on the coat did not say Michael Sutton, and I remember that very specifically. When I looked it up find a Dr. Michael Sutton and, and the only one I found was someone that could have been connected with Oak Ridge Laboratory. And there probably is truly a or, or implant or unidentified object. And they they could take less issue if you call it an unidentified object than if you call it a chip. So then change your manner of speaking about it, say an unidentified object. Or if you've identified it, it was an unidentified object, you have this, uh, investigated. It does indeed have, because that's what they look for, to identify that it's not something that your body, but rather something that was most probably put in the body from an external source. Exactly, and as far as language is concerned, I think Melanie always calls it an unidentified object. But because I had analyzed this thing myself, and I know 100% that it has titanium fibers, and it looks completely synthetic, it is completely synthetic, and the doctor with whom I, um, so the, the actual, uh, not medical doctor, but um, uh, scientist with whom I analyzed it in Switzerland, confirms that it looked nothing, like nothing biological she'd ever seen. So we know it's synthetic, and therefore I call it an implant because it was implanted into us. Something synthetic was put in, you know. And um, so, and and this is this is basically it. And and you're you're absolutely right about the sitter. But wait, what happened next? Because um, so this was the conversation with um, Dr. Maya Sombart and Dr. Frederick Wilson. Um, and then it it I think it finished when Dr. Maya Sombart said, "Oh, this is very threatening. I think we should call the police." But it's your hand to cheek like that. This is not when you're threatened. You don't sit there like that. You know, you would have some sort of protective or stressed um, you know demeanor. And with this, she just walked out. Okay, so I was there, and then at that conversation, Melanie. So the conversation that ensued between Melanie and me, um, she said. Catherine, please stay here at the hospital. There was a um, kind of like a big broad sofa that could be turned into a bed specifically for the accompanying person. And she says, you're the accompanying person, you've got the right. And this is something that was confirmed to us in the beginning. I had the right to come and go 24 seven unobstructed to assist Melanie. And this is what we were told in the beginning. So Melanie said, please, I need a witness here so stay, stay, because something really dodgy is going on. I mean, yes, you know, the baby's been taken away. 
So I said, okay, Manning, that's fine, I'll stay. So, um, you know, she rang for the nurse and we told her I'm going to stay. And the nurse said, fine, I'm going to get the bed linen and get everything ready. So the nurse went away and then immediately, I think some five minutes later or something like that, um, Frederick Milson came back. Um, oh, sorry, I should, I should get the sequence right because Melanie and I, we were talking for, you know, quite some time. So maybe like half an hour passed or something. And in the end, she said, you know, we should, you should really stay here. And I'd agreed and so on. And then suddenly, Dr. Frederick Milson came back. And that's another thing. They always hold the phone. So it looks like a landline cordless phone with which they run around. And it's very telling who runs around with these cordless phones, actually. Um, that's, I, I spotted some sort of pattern. And Dr. Frederick Milson was running around with the phone. Um, so anyway, so he came back. And he said, oh, I'm very sorry, but um, you have to leave now because the visiting time's over. And I said, but I'm the accompanying person. And he said, yes, I'm sorry, but the rules for the accompanying person are only valid as long as the baby is in the room. The baby is now not in the room. Therefore, the accompanying person has no rights to actually be here. And I said, but I'm here for Melanie and not for the baby. And I said, by the way, please go away and check your rules because this is a maternity ward. And if a baby is early, it's often put into an incubator onto the neonatal unit into intensive care maybe. Are you telling me that under your rules, as soon as the baby leaves the room, the father doesn't have a visitation right to his wife? No, he's making it up on as he goes. That's very much my impression, you know. And, and again, I looked at Dr. Frederick Milson and I said, you're removing the last witness, aren't you? And I said that to him. You are removing the last witness, aren't you? And he just ignored it. Shut up. And when he came back, he was there with like three heavy security guards. You know, they just like conjuring these like heavies out of nowhere, you know. And these guys, Richie, so, so after they, the policy. Oh, sorry. So after to see the policy. To leave, you know. I mean, you need to, you, you can actually trip them up with their own words and it's just supposed to be documented if that is in fact true. Let me just make a comment. There is a blue light flashing behind you. Behind you. Yes, it's on a desk or really? something. Really? I don't, do you see something, Millicent? There's a. It's a blue light flashing. Okay, I'm not seeing it on my monitor. Are you seeing it, Karen? Yes, it's behind Catherine, but she has to move a certain way to see it. It's in another room. Sorry, oh, I, was, I was muted. I was trying to explain. I'm sitting in Melanie's room, and behind me is a massive wardrobe with um, um, a mirror. And what you can see is a mirror reflection of the Wi-Fi router opposite. So I that's see. Right. It just happens to can me. You, can you pull the door? Can you pull the door uh, behind you? It's, it's actually locked, so I can't actually change it. Why, can you see a reflection oh, okay. in the mouse? Not if you stay there, not if you stay there. Okay, I'll, I'll stay here. <laughs> it's like, yeah, blue lights actually <laughs> appear quite a lot because as soon as we left the house, there were just blue lights and police absolutely everywhere. So I've seen more police in the last few days than ever before in my life. That's um, <laughs> You know, before you go into that whole story about um, the guards and everything, I just wanted to say a word about Frederick Milson's remarkable name. As you know, we all have been aware recently and for quite a while, all of us who are being assaulted, targeted extrajudicially with electromagnetic weapons, we've become aware that there's all sorts of weird coding being put around us and people with a lot of fake names suddenly appearing around us, very much in the style of the people who show up in these false flag events, you know, the mass shooting events. All of a sudden, people with, you know, double uh, letter names and um, strange coded names show up all around the place. And, and this is something that we've also experienced. And, you know, uh, Frederick LaRoche is, is someone who is one of us now because um, he came to Catherine's attention early on and he was on our show and I have interviewed him extensively and um, you know, written, covered his case somewhat. And of course, Dr. Millicent Black is part of our team. And it's very interesting that we now have a young, um, young psychiatrist, a pedo psychiatrist at Erasme Hospital uh, called Frederick Milson.
And uh, very interesting that he wanders around the corridors with a sort of a cordless phone and produces uh, instructions out of thin air to make people leave the hospital. Very, uh, I point this up merely to suggest that we are living in a world today where intelligence agents are lurking in our midst like flies. And, uh, you know, and they give off a certain air with all of these little symbols and codes and so forth. And um, we're becoming a little adept at figuring out what's going on. <laughs> you know what? And, and had I not experienced the um, incident with, what was his name? Inspector Miskell at Greater Manchester Police, who doesn't seem to exist, even though he wrote me signed letters and he doesn't oh, yes. exist there, you know? <laughs> If that hadn't existed, I would have thought, oh, we're being a bit super sensitive. But given that we had the incident of Inspector Misko, who, as in my current state of knowledge, is he doesn't exist and seems to be an MI5 persona, that can be entirely true. And, and it's so opaque. The system is so opaque. We can't check if people are for real or not. And frankly, based exactly. on... Exactly. And we have to just Ransomoffs, and you know, I think the answer is no. These are synthetic coincidences, which are merely being manufactured all around us. So, yeah, something to be aware of yeah. and laugh at. Exactly, and basically, based on what I've what I've what I've experienced with Greater Manchester Police, and based on the utter lunacy and criminal, frankly, criminal behaviour of people in hospital Erasmus, I really put massive question marks if these people are actually doctors or not because they did not behave like doctors and these yes. people did not behave like psychiatrists. They behave like um, psychological and modern warfare operatives. Yes, exactly. And that's what I really wanted to analyze further. And this is why I've made the comments I've made so far is that, you know, we are not witnessing doctors behaving like doctors. We're not witnessing psychiatrists behaving like people who care deeply about the mental health and well-being of anybody. You know, we are simply witnessing, as you see, um, soldiers wearing psychiatric badges. These are these these are people running military psychological ops on the patients and literally also acting like um, very uh, brutal intelligence agents of the kind that you well you know I'm you're going to go into the story about the the rendition so we'll we'll talk a little bit further about that shortly. Let me ask a question before we go on, Ben, Catherine. Was Melanie ever advised that she was seeing students? And was she given a choice of, of them not attending to her case? I don't think so. The United I'm States. Thinking, technically, I'm not sure if they were students. I mean, I should stress, they to me, they looked like students and behaved like students. And I taught at the university myself. So, you know, this is how I categorized them. But they, they might have been finished with their doctor training or finished a certain part, and they might have been now in training at the hospital. But these people were not experienced, and I, I'm not sure if she, I'm, I'm not sure if she's even aware that she could have demanded an experienced person. I think Dr. Dalman, she looked experienced. She was the, um, and she also said to me that she's the head gynecologist during that shift. So she, I think, ultimately held responsibility that on that shift. But otherwise, I, I don't think so. I mean, we were dealing with very young people most of the time. Well, see, these are things that you, you. Know, make a note so that you can follow up on by asking the question because they have to ask you if you would uh, allow a resident, even if they were a resident or an intern, they have to ask you if you would allow them if, if there is a senior person on the case. And you have the right to say, no, I did it all the time. I wouldn't let anybody but the main doctor care for me. And the reason is they sometimes put people up to take the fall, like the, 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 uh, the midwife. Up and, and so it'll be easy for her to take the fall and all they'll do is shift her to another hospital and she can continue to work. But you see, it won't hurt her career as bad as it would a doctor. That's a very let good anyone but Yeah, I wouldn't let anyone but the, but the MD take care of me for that very reason. That's a brilliant point. And I think everybody listening should take, you know, really careful note of what Melissa has just said because I know that so many people have these problems with hospitals and um, you know and so-called psychiatric assessments. This is a very, very good point. And always going for the people with most to lose in their careers. I think that's a fantastic point. And you know, I mean, now I've become wiser as well. I think we should do it from now on. And the other, the other thing to note, just right along uh, in line with that, Catherine, is the fact that um, 
you know, it's not merely a case of incompetence. I think to call these doctors incompetent is actually doing them a kindness and a generosity that they don't deserve. Um, they committed something extraordinary here, an extraordinary act of removing a woman's baby from her. You know, she has just given birth and they have decided uh, immediately that um, based on all this hearsay from the, from the nurse mid midwife, or so they say, you see, they say that the nurse midwife confided in them all this information about things Melanie is supposed to have said that gave rise to concern and led to them uh, deciding that she needed a psychiatric assessment immediately, she needed a second psychiatric assessment immediately, her baby needed to be removed from her. They engaged in something rather major. They engaged in something very, very major, about as major as you can get. You have a patient coming to a hospital to give birth to her own baby, and then her own baby is suddenly taken away. So, and if they just relied on the word of one midwife, you know, and they did not make any enquiries, as you said, they did not come and speak to you. They did not have you speak with the midwife in their presence in order to ascertain the, the nature and depth of your conversation, etc. They didn't uh, do any of that preliminary conversation, you know, or enquiry. They just ran straight to psychiatric assessment. So that suggests to me that this is not merely a case of incompetence, but that there is possibly a kind of of um, regimented, militarized protocol that they've got going here, that they are simply um, slinging into action immediately, you know? And so th the mention of implants, somebody mentioned implants, therefore we arrest everybody around and we start calling them delusional. That's sort of what they've done here. So you have to ask, why are they doing that? Are they doing that because they really have no idea, they, they were fed wrong information? These guys are doctors, you know, they went to medical school and then they went to psychiatric school, right? They went, they've got a huge bunch of education. They've been in medical school for ages and ages. They're supposed to be highly educated professionals, whether they are young students simple, or whether they're older. A simple ultrasound could have put that whole question to rest. By just doing an ultrasound, seeing if there really was still something in the throat. You see, that would have eliminated that whole situation. They didn't even do the preliminary of asking Catherine about the implant. They didn't even ask, uh, they didn't bring the midwife forward and have like a group discussion. They just did this unilaterally on their own, just as if they were running Guantanamo, you know, a jail cell rather than a hospital. And that is a very good point, actually, because as far as evidence is concerned, when the entire panel, including Dr. Frederick Milson, was assembled, one of the sentences I said is, you can even see the scar after the operation when this was taken out of her throat. When you're sitting there, you can see a scar from here to here. You can yeah. see the medical surgery scar. Yeah. So that, it's, it's right there. And I said, look, she's a patient here. You can you cannot just see scars here. She's also scars elsewhere in her body where there are little implants taken out. So somebody with a dozen scars, you know, and there are also laser surgery scars on her, I think also including on her neck, that are clearly covert laser surgery that you can see, but just it's very hard. And I said she has all the dermatologist reports about laser surgery scars. This is a hospital with doctors, for God's sake. Go and check. Go and check. But it was nobody's interest to check, and that is very, very important. So they were not interested in the evidence. And um, it went ever better from there because what happened is that I, when I was removed, um, and I think that was, I have to check the exact time, but um, I was removed um, um, at the point. I, I got into the car. I drove um, away from the hospital. When I arrived back here, I suddenly got a phone call. Oh, no, I first got a text message from Melanie at quarter past 10 p.m. And this was, I think, I, I think two hours, an hour or two hours after I left the hospital. And Melanie was informed, I think by Dr. Frederick Nelson, that they are calling the police. But this was two hours after I left. And I haven't, you know, I haven't resisted my removal. So two hours later, they decide to speak. And this is what they told Melanie. And it's very telling what they tell the patient because it's always the most dramatic, the most traumatizing way of phrasing it. They just go in and she was just told, we're now calling the police. 
to just go, oh, we're now going, you know, calling the police. No information of what the hell for, you know. And then something like half an hour later or three quarters of an hour later, I get a phone call from Melanie and she says, the police are here. Can you please talk to them? And that was what I heard. So she passes the phone to a police officer. And there were two police officers who fortunately both could speak very good, um, you know, very good English. And the first one, he was very correct. He gave his name and he said, my name is so-and-so. And I just said, please, could you spell it? And, uh, you know, he thought that I want more information. So he gave me his entire officer number, you know, which is like the longest phone number you've ever seen sort of thing. So he just spelled that out and I said, thank you, but also your name, you know, so he was very open. And I said, excuse me, officer, why are you there? Are you there because of me or are you there because of Melanie? And I said, because of me, because I thought this is maybe still a carry on from this ego psychiatrist wanting to call the police, you know, saying, oh, this is very threatening. I think we're going to call the police. That was her sentence. And then the police officer laughed and he said, frankly, I don't know. He said, we're just here, we've been sent because of a procedure and we have to tell, take Melanie for an independent psychiatric assessment. And I was like, okay, so where are you taking her? And he said, she will be at Hospital Brugman. But this is at 11 p.m., you know, at 11 p.m. at night, the day after she gave birth by cesarean section. So I thought, okay, fine, you're taking to another hospital. Okay, he, you know, and I, I talked to him. And, I, and he said, she will be there and, you know, you can, you can talk to her. And he gave the phone back. And I said, okay, Melanie, I will be on call until this is, you know, finished. So please just let me know. So it was, I think... You know, it's utterly, it's utterly inexplicable that they would, first of all, take her to another hospital for a psychiatric assessment, particularly since, you know, she's a new mother who's just given birth. But uh, they'd already had two psychiatric assessments in the hospital during the course of that day. So why on earth would they need to subject her to a third one? That's one big question. The second big question is the whole police, you know, look at the connection between psychiatry and police. You know, and this is what I want people to look at very closely, because before we run off and write our reports about political psychiatry, which is clearly in evidence over here, we are seeing it played out, seeing evidence of a close connection between psychiatry. Why does the police have to be called to take Melanie from one place to another? You know, what is the reason behind that? So I think, and then most importantly, what sort of administrative procedure is it when it's happening at 11 p.m. at night? So Melanie was then, I spoke to the police officer until I think t something like 20 or 25 past 11, and Melanie was taken at 11.30 p.m. In, a, in an ambulance to Hospital Brugman. So and then, you see, I think we have to, the, this hospital has a great deal to answer for, and this is part of what it must be made to answer for, must be held accountable for. This cannot be written off as normal standard procedure, just what we do, just this is our policy, this is our hospital company corporate policy. No, this is nonsense. This is involving the whole life and well-being of a patient who is paying money to come to your hospital and give birth there. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And also, I have to say, Belgium, it's just as bad as France and Germany and Switzerland or the UK. And here, nothing administrative happens, you know, outside. It's pretty much 9 to 5, you would think. But actually, it's more like, you know, 9.30 to 4.30 sort of thing with a one to two hour lunch break. So isn't it amazing that some sort of mandarins have this enthusiasm for administrative procedures after midnight? Isn't that most curious? But she was taken for most... Yeah, but... hmm? There must be something um, traumatizing about midnight because I that happened to me. I was picked up at my home at 6 p.m. in the evening, taken to the hospital. Order from the judge was that I was to be examined by either two doctors or one doctor and one psychologist. When I got to the hospital, a doctor sat at the little round booth they put me in a room so that I could sit in the room and, and look at the doctor sitting at the desk. At least three times I asked to see the doctor. He never came near me. Now, I got there you no know, later than 6.15 in the evening. 
her. The nurse came in and, and, and I kept saying, when am I going to see the doctor? No one came, no, not a doctor came near me. They, they, they did, you know, the usual uh, biological checks, asking for the doctor. No one came. At midnight, at midnight, I said, well, if no one's going to let me see the doctor, then I want to go home. In fact, I had Derek Robinson on the phone, and he said, most of just leave. As I started to try to leave, I called at least three sheriff department cars and two police officers. And then they transferred me to a private psychiatric hospital over an hour away from where I was. After I asked to leave at midnight, I had been at that place for almost six hours, and not one doctor came near me. And now, the doctor that signed the transfer paperwork was not the same doctor that sat behind the desk. I have the documentation. When we got to court, and I had to go to court in another county because I was denied due process here, or I would have never been in that situation. I al I already was seeing a um, and a marriage and family therapist. So you see, I was already doing what I needed to do, but I wasn't allowed to go to court to tell that to the judge. So when I finally get to the court, seven days later, the, when I got to the second hospital, the night clerk, the doctor told the night, night clerk there that Nobody, that wasn't in any record that had been sent to the court. Nothing, nothing like that. It wasn't in the, in the, uh, in the records at the hospital either. I told a, a, a therapist that hmm, several years later, a couple years later, she said that was so they could keep you, Millicent. That was the only way they could keep you. They had to lie. Yeah, totally but, lie. Absolutely. But it was, it was seven days later before I get to see a judge. To me, and she said to the court, and they were indeed asking. Uh, they were asking the court to order me to be kept at that hospital longer, order me to, to uh, on psychotropic drugs. But the judge said to them, she said, first of all, nobody obeyed the first judge's orders, and that was that she would see two doctors or a doctor and a psychologist, and he even gave them a parameter by which I had to be released, even if I had not seen a doctor or, or a psychologist, and that was 48 hours, eight days later, before I get to see a judge. But she said, I'll order her released immediately. Wow. That is, so that that is absolutely You got a decent judge by accident. Yeah. And, and, and what, is, what is astounding is that um, in all this, one of the things I have not witnessed, I have not witnessed is, you know, after this whole debacle started, a single doctor or psychiatrist with any concerns for the true well-being of Melanie and her baby. Because separation from the mother is also traumatic from the baby. I have not seen a single instance where there was actually any concern for real health. So this is not a medical procedure. Also, it can't be a standard administrative procedure. I mean, who on earth does a psychiatric assessment on somebody between midnight and 2 a.m.? And, so, and weren't there a whole bunch of pedo psychiatrists involved who should have cared about the little child, you know, the exactly. baby, the newborn baby? Exactly. The mental health of that newborn baby being traumatically removed from her mother? Yeah, and these are first of all really these psychiatrists are doing nothing but acting like you know gendarmes. Yeah, and I, as, I think prison guards. The trauma of it was to get her, her to say things that they could because they had nothing. Yeah, I think so. They ask you, well, what's the problem? Or why are you here? And I would constantly say, what do you have on your paperwork? Because exactly. you see, even if you repeat what they said about why you're here, they can use that and say, well, she said, well, no. What do you have on your paperwork? Let them tell you what they have. This is, um, this is brilliant advice from Millicent, actually. That's brilliant advice. You have to, because also they want to make you work 
And this is another repeat theme. You know, they want to generate a lot of work for you have to explain yourself and they don't explain anything. And this is another telltale sign. To this day, we have not seen a single psychiatric report. We have not seen a single psychiatric report. Melanie was not given access to her own medical files to this day. And we had a court hearing yesterday. When, when we went into the court hearing, we had nothing from the other side. Had I not recorded the names, they would not even have released the names. And they still have not given us the name of the nurse Elaine with whom I talked. You know, I still don't know her surname. This is shocking. But it, it's been basically from there. And I think what's very important is to what then followed after I've been removed. Because I got this phone call, I talked to the police, I knew that she was going to be transferred. And she was transferred at 11.30 p.m. from Hospital Erasmus to Hospital Brugman. By the way, the next day I talked to a lawyer and she said it's not even allowed to separate a, a new mother from her baby. They can be on different rooms, they can be in different stations in a hospital, but they're not allowed to be separated to be in two different hospitals. That is not allowed. And also, Melanie would have had a right to see her baby every single day. This was not granted to her. She has not seen her baby since last Thursday at roughly four o'clock. But then what yeah. followed is this is Sorry. all about this is i just want to interject one little statement and that is this whole scenario here this whole imbroglio this whole saga that's played out has all been to take away melanie's rights her intrinsic rights as a mother to be with her newborn they have using psychiatry tried to and so far succeeded in taking away her rights uh, to be with her to be with her baby and that's sort of the crux of the problem here that you know the legal team needs to address exactly and i also think this has been premeditated everything that happened wasn't like a, just by accident this was a very well planned very smoothly executed thing so it was premeditated at many stages and because it removed her fundamental rights that's why i also say it was criminal this is a criminal operation that i've witnessed it was all against her rights, premeditated. And also, it, it was always, every step was such to cause maximum trauma and maximum damage to her, her baby, and also her father, her family, you know. And I will explain why, because imagine she's transferred for, um, to Hospital Brookman, and I emphasize this was even on the books for an independent psychiatric assessment. Now, I don't, I question the validity of a psychiatric assessment when it is under duress, when it is one day after a major operation, and when the patient is denied the painkillers. Because Melanie was denied painkillers from the point that she was removed to the hospital. Okay? So, she is denied her painkillers, she's transferred in, a, in an ambulance, but then she's put through an interrogation between midnight and 2 a.m., two hours, and there she's not lying in a hospital bed, she was in an office sitting at a desk in an interrogation room. Now, I as a witness, I can confirm that Melanie was there because at half time, after pretty much one hour, she called me and we had a Skype call with video call and because she had Skype on her phone. And I could see, I said, Melanie, are you at the desk? Because I could see that she was sitting, leaning on her elbows and I could see an office building. And she says, yes, I'm sitting at the desk. This is the interrogation room. So she was not in a hospital bed between midnight and 2 a.m. So this is, for me, maximum stress. And this is telltale intel. This is intel. This is not, this is not medical. This is secret service. This is CIA extraordinary rendition type of stuff, trying to cause maximum stress, maximum trauma to the person being interrogated. But after one hour exactly, we had this Skype call and she says, good news at least, because the psychiatrist, or who knows, the person she talked to, right, we still don't know the name, the person she talked to after one hour said to her, my opinion is that you should be immediately transferred back to the maternity ward at Hospital Erasmus. And I can confirm that Melanie said that to me after one hour. Then she, she stopped the Skype call and she said, hang on, I'll call you later because he's coming back. So then she put down the Skype call, and as I promised to be on call until the whole thing is finished, I stayed up. And at quarter past 2 a.m. in the morning, I got a panic phone call from Melanie from her phone, and she says, I'm calling you from the toilet. 
about to take my mobile phone away. And she said, now the plan has changed. He was told by somebody, he went out, he talked to somebody, and that person told him, it's already fixed. She's being transferred back to the psychiatric unit of Hospital Erasmus, not the maternity ward, the psychiatric unit. But his ex so called independent psychiatric assessment, it means that it was overruled by some undisclosed parties. So this means this is not even an independent psychiatric assessment. No independent psychiatric assessment has been taken account, into account because the person doing it himself confessed that his decision was overruled. And then what happened to Melanie is that she called me from the toilet. There was a very brief conversation because she said, I've got to go. And she told me afterwards when I then got to talk to her again, that as soon as people outside heard that she was on the phone, they started slamming the door and they said, come out because it's taking too long or we, you know, we're opening the door. And at that point, at quarter past 2 a.m., her phone was removed and I heard nothing anymore. So I knew from her that she's going to be transferred back to Hospital Erasmus, to the psychiatric ward, but nothing else. So the next morning, I got up and I went straight to the hospital. And I said, because my, nobody informed me officially, right? So they didn't know I had talked to Melanie. So I went straight to the maternity ward. I went into her room and I saw that the entire room had already been cleared. She had that room booked, a single room, was paid for by her health insurance all the way until Sunday. Because the standard is that when you have a cesarean operation, you're under observation and you have to recover for four days. For four days, you're not allowed, really, you shouldn't be leaving your hospital room. You cannot be discharged. So how the hell can it be that after one day, you're considered, and this is something that has to be authorized by the doctor's autonomy. Dr. Gelman's must have authorized that the patient a day after major surgery was fit for transfer, for interrogation, right? Even though she wasn't considered fit for discharge. How curious. And then the next day I went there, I saw that all her stuff had been removed from the cupboards to a room that was already paid for and already booked until Sunday. On Friday morning, her stuff had been removed. And I thought, that's strange. This means that they must have removed her stuff when she went to hospital Brookburn, knowing full well when she left, that she's not going to return to the maternity ward. So I can, as a witness, say that Hospital Erasmus knew that she's not going to return to that maternity ward. Because at that time, they had not known yet, you know, what room she's going to end up in in a psychiatry. So I went to the front desk and I said, where is Melanie? Where is Melanie? And they said, oh, sorry, we can't tell you. This is medically private information. And I said, I'm the accompanying person. Where is Melanie? It's gone from her room. She's, she's meant to be here until Sunday. Where is Melanie? And then, literally, I was trying to be very forceful. They said, oh, you know, suddenly they can talk. And they said, oh, she's at Hospital Brugman. I said, what is she doing there? Explain to me, what is she doing there? I'm, I'm here, the accompanying person. What is the plan? And they said, oh, oh, don't worry, she's going to return. I said, brilliant, but when? Oh, we can't tell you. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stand here and stare at you until she's coming back. I'm not moving. I'm standing here. Of course, when you have somebody at reception just there twiddling their thumbs, they said, oh, okay, okay. Why don't you sit down over there? So they put me into their meeting room from where I could see the, the phone desk. So I just sat there. I said, fine, I've got all the time in the world. I'm just sitting. I got my laptop out and was typing away, writing down an actual log of what had just happened. And then, you know, I could hear the phone calls. And at some point, I, I'm pretty sure I overheard the receptionist saying, okay, you can bring, you can bring Melanie Richan at 8.30 p.m. And I overheard that. I overheard her name at 8.30 p.m. I thought, now that's very interesting. This maternity ward seems to tell the other hospital when to bring her back. So I didn't say anything. And at some point, I think they figured out that I could hear every conversation because they kept looking over to me, you know, being very nervous. And then they decided to move me from that room. And they said, oh, sorry, can you sit over here? So they wanted to put me into a room behind the till, which they considered to be really far in the corner. So I said, fine, I'll sit there. And I just pulled the chair such that I could see the entire reception area behind them. And I could see them from behind in every conversation and see all the computer screens. So I was like, brilliant. 
he put me into pole position. So I just sat there and I thought, I've got all the time in the world. And I just made noise, opening and closing my laptop, sighing occasionally, you know, and this really made them nervous. And eventually when I thought I had enough, I was like, right, I packed everything together, planning my, you know, laptop, put it into the, the you know, a trolley suitcase I had with all my computing equipment, pulled it to the desk and I said, where is Melanie? When is she going to come? Can you tell me when she's going to be back? And then magically, this woman said, oh, she just arrived. Like, what a miracle. You know, she just arrived in Hospital Erasmus. I thought, brilliant. Then I'll go and see her. Can I see her? Yes, I can. And they said, go down into the emergency. And then what unfolded is again key. Because I was told that I can see her. I went down into the emergency section where the, the ambulances arrived. And there I was told that indeed Melanie had arrived, but I was not allowed to see her. And this was from a psychiatrist down there. And she said, nobody is allowed to see Melanie. And I said, but why? And th she said, that's, that's the procedure. Nobody is allowed to see her. You can see her later when she's up in psychiatry. And afterwards from Melanie, I understood why no one is allowed to see her. Because at Hospital Brugman, already after this, what I call this like, extraordinary rendition interview, she was put, she, as she said, uh, she was put into a room and locked into a room without a toilet that just had not a hospital bed it had like one of these like bunk beds you know wannabe makeshift beds with these massive straps where you can hold people down now is that where you make a new a mother who's just been through a cesarean operation is that where you make them sleep and she said she was locked in without a toilet so every time she had to go to the toilet you know she had to knock on the little prison window thing and then wait for people. And she said, these people seem to take extra long to make it down to her and open the door. So I think this is where you yeah, make it you, day to night if you want to traumatize them. Did you say that the mattress was on the floor? That was, at first I thought that was at Hospital Brookman. And this is what happened. This is why I wasn't allowed to see her in the original hospital. Because there, in the emergency, when she had arrived, after being transported back with the ambulance, she said they locked her into a room where there wasn't even a bed. It was just a mattress on the floor. And I could... I you see the extra... Okay. I, I was just going to say the extra stress of having to get up and down off the floor with stitches in her stomach would have then caused... Could, could also cause a delay in healing. So she definitely wants to uh, pay attention to how she's feeling in that area of her stomach because all that extra stress of getting up and down. I mean, they tell you, you know, when you're not supposed to climb steps and all those things. So you, tell her to be sure to pay attention to how she's feeling and how she's healing in her inner stomach area. Exactly. And I think this is a hospital. Where it's it's unheard of. It's a hospital. It's, it's a hospital. It's supposed yeah. to take care of its patients and we cannot stress this yeah. enough, you know. We cannot yeah. say it too many times. And they are taking this woman who has just delivered a baby, subjecting her to intense trauma, three psychiatric assessments, rendition in the middle of the night, traumatic off-site, off-site at another location, and then bringing her back and throwing her in another prison-style prison room with, uh, with a mattress on the floor where she literally has to sit on that mattress on the floor. Now, you know, this is, we should say that this is um, a highly developed Western European, this is a hospital which has actually delivered the babies of Belgian royalty, treating a patient in this fashion. Exactly. And I think it's this is um, and also no hospital, I, I not even in communist Romania were people made to sleep on a mattress on the floor. And by the way, she was also locked in. And that's key again, because that's prison. I mean, this is this is entirely C, like straight out of the CIA trauma based mind control handbook, by the way. It Next is. This is this yeah. is the CIA Kubrick manual and the human resource exploitation training manual. The, the, these are precisely the kinds of procedures that they use to int to intimidate and um, and um, threaten people, you know, and put them into a, a st state of extreme stress. Exactly. So, and this stuff is actually written up in these manuals. So it's absolutely horrifying that this was done to her. The other thing that was done was the thing that you talk about the phone, where she was. Um, to you on the phone and then they were banging on the door trying to get her out telling her she needed to come out 
Exactly. And that's another thing, yeah. telling what you've just been given birth that she's taking too long in the toilet. She can take as long as she's spraying me like. Exactly. And that, you know, and this is a grown woman who has just given birth and they're, 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 they're treating her both as a child and as a prisoner. And that's, those are attitudes and actions of extreme control. Exactly. And I, right. Exactly. And I would, I would also add to the word control, another C word, the criminality. This is oh, a telltale yes. sign, criminal operation. So I would say whoever was slamming the door there, Whoever did this, you know, the extraordinary rendition with this, this really unusual interview was a criminal because the person knew who had a, a woman who just given birth the day before in front of him. So I'm sorry, but anybody who does that in a hospital is a criminal. And whoever locked her in. You know, this is, and, and we should use another word, you know, it, it's criminal, it's traumatizing, and it's terrorizing. Was right. Terrorized. Ramola, you Ramola made a really good comment when she said they were treating her like a child. They, uh, the CIA enhanced interrogation tactics use age regression. And that is indeed one of the ways that they were doing it to, to Melanie. Very good point. And we should write up all this in a JIT report and actually analyze it because none of this had any sort of medical content and it had all the telltale signs of the procedures of Intel of criminal operations, black ops, otherwise known as criminal ops of Intel. So this is why I'm saying this was a criminal operation or criminal secret service operation that we've been through. Because let's think about it this way, you know, what are the chances, what are the chances if this was just a misunderstanding that the doctors to whom I clarified that I was the person, I have, you know, talked to the midwife, I was the person analyzing Melanie's implant. I was there giving them all the evidence. What are the chances if, if it had been just a misunderstanding that they would reject the evidence? Normal doctors would be like, oh, there's more information on this case. Tell us more. Give us more information. Do you have anything? And another thing I forgot to mention, very important. When the police came or before the police came, Melanie was trying to give Dr. Frederick Wilson actual physical evidence about the implant in her throat because Melanie had at that time still her laptop with her and the reason why she carries her laptop, by the way, everywhere is because, precisely because, her flat is broken into almost every time she leaves the house. And by the way, today when we came back, when I picked up Melanie again, we had evidence that they broke into this flat and they opened this wardrobe, which I'm not sure if you can see, there's a lock. And she had locked it and taken the key with her. And they had broken in when I went to pick up Melanie. And when we came back, this thing was open. The door had been flung open, and by the way, opposite, there's a motion control sensor that would have rang, and I activated that sensor myself when I left, and it would have rang an alarm. There was no alarm, and the doors were open. So how can this be? So they broke into the flat today, again. And they, by the way, also put this yellow sticky substance on dishes that Melanie's father and I had washed ourselves. So I can confirm that Melanie's flat was broken into today. So, this is a and I should just mention a very classic intelligence um, threatening and intimidation co style procedure. Dr. Rowney Kilder has written about it as happening in Europe where the military and intelligence agencies are working on implanting people and covertly breaking into people's houses and that telltale sticky stuff is left everywhere. So that's in her book, Bright Lights and Black Shadows. And, and also, okay. by the way, the um, ex-general counsel for the World Bank, Karen Hudas, she has put out in her PDFs, um, she even put out the statement that they broke into her f uh, flat, um, um, house and what she, she wrote, they put again gunk into my dishwasher, the sticky gunk into the dishwasher. It seems to be a standard thing that the intelligence agencies are doing and we have now all these high profile people saying the same thing. And I can confirm it. So we are now dealing with a criminal ops by Belgian intelligence here, you know. And under that light, everything makes sense. And this is and this is not perfect because we're a criminal investigative team, and this is criminal what has been happen been happening here. But then and what you know, 
And, and what happened to Melanie, all of this stuff that, you know, she's being sectioned in this fashion while she's sitting in a hospital and she really is helpless to defend herself um, has, has been happening and continues to happen to many people in the USA and in Europe. People are being dragged into psychiatric wards, being committed and being charged with being delusional for all of these reasons, for mentioning that they are being hit with electromagnetic electromagnetic weapons, which indeed people are using on them, and that they're implanted. Many of, you know, and many of these implants have actually been scanned and been discovered, and there's evidence for their existence. So this, this uh, program of disbelieving people and of sectioning them and throwing them into psych wards and then terrorizing them and traumatizing them, this whole program, you know, it, it, of psychological terrorism, is so related to what the intelligence agencies are doing that I think it's important to talk about it in that light as well, sort of contextualize it for everybody and, and uh, make it clear to people that this is indeed what's going on, that where there is psychiatry and law enforcement working together to threaten, intimidate and terrorize people, there is inevitably the hand of intelligence as well. Absolutely. working behind the scenes absolutely and and i think we should we will we will treat this as a case study as a jit case study that we will i i will write this up as a case study and we will publish this and people can refer to it in their court cases as an actual documented case this is now uh, you know the goal so everybody listening has to understand this is bigger than just melanie and her baby that's already bad enough but we want to take this and we are making it as into we're turning this into ammunition that people can use in court cases to refer to another example of criminal actions at a hospital so one of the things i wanted to say which also shows that this is a criminal operation and had nothing to do with actually concern by psychiatric staff about um the, the welfare of melanie and her baby is the fact that when melanie was talking to dr frederick nelson when she still had her laptop she was trying to show him evidence but specifically the analysis results from switzerland from the specialist lab about the implant in her throat show, showing that it's clearly synthetic material showing the very high titanium content and showing the clearly visible titanium fibers that are in this implant. So she brought it up and she was showing it to Dr. Frederick Melson, who refused to look at it. He refused to look at it. Then when the police officers came, and I just found the detail written down when I was on the phone to Melanie, and the first police officer who I talked to was an officer, Carwells, so that's spelled C-A-U-W-E-L-S. So he can confirm that this happened. And um, inspector, you know, police officer Corwells was shown, and by the way, I've got an officer number, that's 04469-90548. That is the police officer of Brussels Police, um, District Anderlecht, or Anderlecht, that's in charge of Hospital Erasmus. And he was shown by Melanie the evidence from the Swiss lab and these are the red plots because Melanie and I already published them. We've shown them here on the Techno Crime Fighters Forum and Melanie and I showed it in the German version. We've shown the results and this police officer was shown these results by Melanie when he arrived and Melanie said, look, everything I said about the implant in my throat, you can see the scar here, is true. And here is the scientific evidence from the Swiss Paul Scherer Institute, right? Now this police officer looked at it, understood its relevance and then he turned to the um, uh, he turned to Dr. Frederick Melson, the psychiatrist, and the police officer said to the psychiatrist, "I think you should look at this." So it was the police officer ordering, we had to order the doctor to look at the evidence because the doctor refused. Now, at that point, Frederick Melson's reply apparently was, "Okay, maybe, but the procedure has already been started." And afterwards, we found oh. out what the procedure was. And it was, I think, nominally a cover your ass procedure. <laughs> I think we got in touch with the attorney general and got him or some court, somebody we still don't know because we haven't seen the order that demanded the transfer to hospital Brookman, but they ordered an independent psychiatric assessment. So that was the procedure. And it was started by Dr. Maya Sombach and Dr. Frederick Milson. Catherine, what you've been describing, though, about the way that uh, Melanie was treated and has been treated is actually something that you probably could find in the CIA behavior modification manual. 
Excellent point. And, and, and actually, I, I wish that you would uh, ask Melanie to go back and pull up the the uh, the steps in an enhanced interrogation tactic or what is uh, considered to be the torture, you know, the, the CIA torture manual uh, tactics and write her write her experience in it. I've done that and it's very, very astonishing. But she would be able to to see how that happened to her in every step. Everything that they've used, she would have uh, been able to document and this is how it happened to me. Um, Dr. Robert Duncan wrote the, uh, a report uh, on no-touch torture and that report actually does describe the enhanced interrogation steps as it is done to us. That's a fantastic point, actually. And in the case study, we should write it up exactly. And we should show how every step of everything was done was literally like, you know, step one, step two, step three of this very well planned, exactly as you say, Intel torture uh, scheme, a template. These people were working to a template, absolutely. And at every point, it's clear how they refused to see evidence and also how it was it was never, the concern was never to maximize medical well-being. The, the concern was at every step, maximize yeah. psychological torture. I completely agree. Yeah. And, and also, yeah. we analyze the whole thing using statistics and say, what are the statistical chances of it being just an honest, um, you know, we start off with an honest, um, innocent um, misunderstanding. What are the chances then that the doctors refuse to hear evidence at the point when this procedure was not uh, launched? That was the very first panel discussion where Dr. Frederick Milson was present when I was there to corrupt and they would have corrected any misunderstanding. You know, but at that point, they didn't even know who had made these false allegations. And, and the, the one thing we had is from a nurse called um, Lamia who said that she overheard that it was something that Melanie had said to the night nurse. Now that turned out to be false. But no one could clarify it and they nevertheless started this procedure that turned out to be this really unusual late night administrative procedure. Now I ask if this is truly the procedure of the attorney general or some court or whatever here in, in Belgium, I mean, I already would question that in the court of human rights, genuinely. You know, what is an independent psychiatric assessment worth when it's done between midnight and 2 a.m.? I mean, on a normal day between midnight and 2 a.m., I'm, I'm very, very, you know, rough to actually talk to. You know, on some days I don't make much sense. But what is the probability distribution of people still talking sense a day after a major operation when their medical, the actual painkillers have been, you know, denied, they've been put through a traumatic experience and then they're interrogated between midnight and 2 a.m.? I mean, I really ask, what are the chances of that? And then, what are the chances that hospital workman doesn't have a proper hospital bed for a woman like that after a major operation? They might have run out of hospital beds, so they put on a, you know, this bed with restraints. Could be because they're stuck. What's the probability of that happening? Okay, but what is also the conjunct probability of the next day, hospital Erasmus in emergency not having a hospital bed, a proper one for Melanie? Well, the chances of all these things concatenating is essentially zero. And I just happened to be down in emergency on Friday morning, and I could tell that there were free hospital beds. I was right opposite one, and there's a room, there's a reception down in emergency, and I think the room opposite has the number 18. I'm pretty sure, 8 or 18. And in there, there, are, there were free, two, two free hospital beds, unused. So Melanie could have had those. And also, I happened to be present when a to totally raving drunk was brought in, actually by two police officers. Well, his room was also not locked. So what is the chance of pe people by accident locking Melanie in the room with just a mattress on the floor? So the probability for that is essentially zero. And therefore, on the balance of probabilities, I would say this was a criminal operation. It was premeditated to cause maximum drama. And that wasn't just just got worse yeah. and worse from there because Friday when I heard that I can talk to Melanie when she's up on psychiatry I decided I had to leave the hospital to pick up her father who arrived at the train station so I picked up her father and I drove him back to the hospital because he was scheduled to arrive on Friday to see his newborn granddaughter now I had to tell him that his daughter is now in psychiatry and 
I, at that stage, I taught them, well, the, the current state of knowledge is she said something to the night nurse. This is what they claim, but we know it's a lie. So we drove to the hospital, and at, in psychiatry, we were told that no one is allowed to see the baby. So that the grandfather was denied his right to see his grandchild. Now, this is very suspicious, because why would a hospital deny the right to the grandfather? He wasn't, you know, stamped mad. Why is the accompanying person denied the right to check up on the baby? But the hospital got a court order, as, we, as it turned out, that night, or, you know, early in the morning on Friday, and the court order was no one was allowed to see the child for 30 days. And that Melanie had to be confined inside her child because of extreme delusions and because she was she was morbidly mentally ill and she was not aware of her surroundings. She wasn't conscious. Oh, this is so extremely illegal and so extremely criminal what this hospital has done. They Do you actually, know what happened? They actually disallowed anybody from visiting the baby, even the grandfather and you during this exactly. entire time period? Exactly. And I do have a copy of the of the court order, which was signed by a judge, a Sterk, I think. Hang on. I've got the ordinance. This is ordinance number 3178. And this was printed off on 20th of October at 17 hours, 17 minutes. Hmm. 17, and 17, does that ring a bell? And anyway, pure coincidence. One of these many coincidences. And this... ...realistic operations that these... Satanists engage in. Exactly. But the this was signed, not signed by hand, signed by print. Le juge de la jeunesse, Cirque F. And uh, le greffier délégué, uh, I can't even pronounce the surname, Bouffiou, F, who knows, something. But the judge was Cirque, so Judge Cirque. And the sentence that is just takes the breath away is, um, so um, based on the medical report, established on 19th of October 2017, so the day before, and this must be a medical report based on the two interviews with the psychiatrist and the three people psychiatrists, based on the medical um, report concluding a un trouble délirant et une absence de conscience morbide chez la mère, elle a en effet été hospitalisée sous constrainte au sein du service psychiatrique de l'hôpital Erasmus. So on, in English, um, based on the medical report of the 19th of October, concluding a delirious trouble and an absence of awareness, a morbid absence of awareness in the mother, she has to be hospitalized under constraint and so basically con confined to psychiatry of hospital Erasmus. Now, I have talked to Melanie on the 19th. Wow, that's the absolutely incredible. That's and it's a lie. And her father, who talked to her on the 20th, and I, who talked to her on most, you know, um, throughout the 19th and the 20th, I can confirm that Melanie was perfectly clear in the head. That's why she's an And I have, you know, looking to her. Um, she is as astute and as, um, you know, on the ball as ever and as um, intellectually aware and um, emotionally aware as she always has been. And uh, if we can tell that, and, you know, we are not trained psychologists. We're just people relating to each other as humans. And if we can pick up absolute normalcy in each other, what on earth is a psychiatrist doing? Picking up something else altogether. You know, that suggests that, that person is not really a psychiatrist. That person is engaging in an extreme agenda of uh, psychological terror. Exactly. And also, I want to say that I have spoken to Melanie on the phone several times of the 19th. I've spoken to her in the afternoon after they've taken her baby away. I literally talked to her, I think, about an hour or an hour and a half after they've taken somebody's baby away. One of the most traumatic things. If you were so delirious, you should be in a total tizzy. She was... She was totally calm. She was upset, but totally calm. In fact, she was, you know, less, uh, how to say, you know, excited than I was. And I was frankly bouncing off the walls. So if anybody would have hospitalized, somebody would have been me over Melanie, you know. And, and any, anyone who's subjected to such trauma of having your baby taken away is, I think, entitled to express any kind of angst, you know, during that moment. Because, of course, she's going to be upset. 
Yeah, I think it's okay. extreme hysterics would have been totally warranted. You know, exactly. absolutely. So I, based on the fact that I've seen Melanie for most of the, um, you know, the 18th and pretty much half the 19th of October and half the 20th of October, I would say this extreme psychiatric reward. I mean, these these psychiatrists were, con were basically certifying extreme mental illness, extreme mental illness. Um, that suddenly must have turned on, poof, just a few hours after I left and would have puffed into thin air without a trace ever since. Yeah, you know, and Catherine, is that the order that's still being held? Is that the one that demands that the child be separated from the mother for 30 days? I think it is, yeah. It's, I am actually checking, it's the, that order is on the second page. And here it is in writing by Judge Cirque, les visites de la mère ou toute autre personne de la famille au extérieur à celle-ci sont interdites à tout le moins, de, uh, à tout le moins dans l'attente des premières investigations du service de l'aide à la jeunesse. So this means visits from the mother or any other persons from the family or from the exterior, so any third party, are thereby forbidden. Um, and basically until the investigations of the, uh, of the, uh, the youth court or the youth services, so it's the social services for the youth are being conducted. Okay, so that's the sentence to the best of my translation. Um, by Judge Sir, based on two very forceful psychiatric assessments. And, and another key, another key for us investigators, a key sign is that the judge put it into writing that this was based, um, forgive me, um, the judge put it into writing that this was based on a medical report from the 19th of October. Now, the extraordinary rendition was actually technically on the 20th and would not have reached the judge until the 20th because it was done between midnight and 2 a.m. on the 20th. So the judge writing on the 20th is basing this decision on psychiatric reports from the 19th of October by his own statement. Now, on the 19th of October, there was only an interview of less than 15 minutes with Dr. Delhaye and something like 20 minutes with three pedopsychiatrists. Now I'm asking who can actually confirm an extreme mental illness in just less than a quarter of an hour and less than half an hour. It's, it must have been so extreme. Melanie would have been raving and must have been in danger of causing harm to her baby. It must have been so extreme that anybody could have noticed it, right? And this is why they pulled in three or four psychiatrists to come sort of gang up on Melanie and, and come up with the right. story that she's so delusional and so extremely delusional. You know, they sort of, they right. obviously took no time for this assessment. They did it at, in post haste really, really fast. Um, they were anxious to give her the worst possible diagnosis, calling it extreme delusion, morbidity, et cetera. You know, total uh, disjunction and um, it's schizoid disorder in, in a sense of remo being removed from reality and being from the environment. Um, and they're doing this extreme diagnosis and they've got three or four people to back them up. Other people from their contingents of, of um, you know, fake psychiatry. Exactly. So basically the judge was presented, which must have been a testimony, but perhaps of four people. So of course the judge who receives an order like that or a report, it must have been a written report by the psychiatrist of four people. Of course he's going to put something into order like that. I mean, frankly, I would also ask the judge, I'm sorry, you know, uh, my lord, have you actually checked the time scale here? And there, there are some psychiatrists who are, you know, have some suddenly di discovered an extreme, an extreme mental illness in a woman who's just given birth. I mean, the day after you give birth, aren't you allowed to be a bit in a mess, you know? Surely. And unless you're physically violent to your child, I'm sorry. You, and also, you're pumped full of painkillers and heck knows what, you know? So... I mean, what judge decides that? You know, so the one good thing that's come out of this, at this point, I think, is that what these guys have done, what these extremely, um, you know, incredible psychiatrists have done at this point, they've really turned the spotlight on psychiatry. They've really turned the spotlight themselves on themselves by these actions, which are completely incomprehensible. I can't imagine anybody who is a mother who could understand what these psychiatrists have done. Anybody who is a normal oh. human being hearing the story and seeing the way in which every oh. single one of these events has played out, who could look at what these people have done and possibly condone it. 
Exactly. Everything that these psychiatrists have done is absolutely insane. Absolutely. No? So and they've turned the spotlight. Like they've created an occasion now for all of us as investigators to really hone in and focus on this whole phenomenon of psychiatry and to ask some very, very pertinent questions about what on earth it's really doing in the hospital, what on earth it's doing in a maternity ward, how it's connected with gynecology or with mothers who come in to give, give birth to babies, and what's the connection with law enforcement? Why are the police so quickly responding to calls from psychiatrists? And why are psychiatrists able to threaten guests who come onto the premises of the hospital, et cetera? You know, many questions, many questions to be asked. Well, at, at some point, uh, Catherine, I would like you to, and I will send it to you, I would like you to compare the hospital records from my, what Melanie has endured. And so then we will have documented again that both in the United States and in Germany, this is happening. So now, if it's happening to me and it's happening to her, and we are worlds apart, what's the problem? I mean, the exact same scenario have a an email that came from from Alf, uh, from Alfred he says he's just left a detailed message on Melanie's mobile that uh, Alexandra has a good plan in place to get a uh, a medical lawyer involved in Belgium so you to surely be aware of your phone calls and and you know and be be ready to answer I think this is this is very important because I think what I'm what I've, I'm pretty much so this is my my best assessment here based on the evidence I've just given um, that this was not a medical procedure it had never had M Melanie's um, medical best interest not even the baby's best interest because we know and, and Melanie uh, sorry Millicent actually sent um, you know um, a reference to the um, it was the what was it called the physiological psychiatry journal in 2011 that pointed out the importance of the baby being with the mother in the first few days um, and I will, I will explain how but what, what this this hospital Erasmus has done is maximally damaging to Melanie's well-being and especially the well-being of the baby now given that that's the case we are dealing here with criminal charges and as, as I said this was premeditated and had such a concatenation of extremely irregularities, extreme irregularities that are statistically impossible to concatenate themselves like that. You know, we're dealing here with, with a criminal conspiracy, a criminal conspiracy to cause maximum trauma and maximum physical and psychological harm to Melanie and her baby and maximum psychological trauma to her father, so to the entire family. And, and actually there's much- Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, I uh, just pulled up that document that Chris furnished to me, Chris Burton, when, you know, he was doing his recent interviews on neurotorture with me. And uh, he's done an incredible job because what he did was he took the CIA Kubrick manual and he took the, another CIA manual, which was released in FOIA in the 90s um, to the Baltimore Sun. It's the Human Resource Exploitation Training Manual. And he took KGB techniques and he took, he looked at, um, other torture techniques and he put them together and he looked at this book called the trauma of psychological torture disaster and trauma psychology edited by almarindo e ojeda and it's got you know a whole bunch of information from various authors and he's talking about techniques that are, are um, both in CIA torture and in the CIA torture, precisely to induce the will to resist, you know, so traumatize somebody that they sort of give up and they engage in the state of learned help, helplessness, right? And part of what they are, and I'll very quickly run through a couple of, a few of these. One is isolation, complete solitary confinement, no social contact for the prisoner, monopolization of attention, physical isolation, small bare windowless cells, sometimes complete darkness, induced debilitation and exhaustion, semi-starvation or exposure to cold or heat, um, prolonged interrogation, prolonged constraint, forced sitting or standing at attention, um, cultivation of anxiety and despair through threats of death, threats of any kind, threats of non-repatriation, threats of endless isolation, vague threats, uh, threats against the prisoner's family, alternating punishments and rewards to remind the prisoner how pleasant things can be, and then to prevent him from adjusting to doing without comforts, 
extreme fluctuations of interrogators' attitudes, demonstrating the omnipotence and omniscience of the captor, uh, gathering detailed facts about the prisoner. Interrogators attempt to create the impression they know all about him, including the answers to the questions they ask. Uh, so that the interrogation is only a test of the cooperativeness and veracity of the prisoner, who's constantly accused of lying and being caught in lies. Degradation, personal hygiene prevented, withholding of combs, filthy, unfested surroundings, uh, demeaning punishments. Now, you know, clearly there were no demeaning punishments in this case, but in terms of, sort of lo locking her in a room without a toilet, etc., with only a mattress on the floor. And yeah, I think I, I just wanted to say also. Also, the, the room with the mattress, she also describes as filthy. Oh, think, great. That, then, then it's straight out of this playbook here. This is a playbook of torture techniques. This is torture, you know, classic torture. Um, and so on. Punishments are meted out, forced to rewrite their answers, and forcing trivial and absurd demands. So all of that is uh, from Seligman. Exactly. And you know what? We should, given that these, the other party is engaging in this, we should start adopting their techniques as well. And we should just, you know, remind them of the omnipotence of the public opinion and the millions of people around the world who've been harmed by intelligence agencies and such criminal activities. And we should remind them that we will hound them to the end of the earth and bring them to justice. Really, we should just keep saying that, you know, every single time we will get these criminals because we're now coming together and nothing they try will be worth much because we're now mathematically past the point of no return. So what we're now going to do is exactly what Millicent said. We're just going to put cases next to each other. And as Millicent said, it's an identical playbook being play, played out in, in the US with an you know, identical playbook moves here in Belgium. This means this is a global program. But mm -hmm. this means in reverse that we can compare victim cases and they will be hinting, pointing at exactly the same pattern. So a way to get the criminals in one country will give us feedback on how to get the criminals. So the investigation what this means is it will be going, the, the speed of the investigation will accelerate and we're going to go exponential at some point because people will start duplicating what we're doing across the world and we can use the same methods across the world. Yes, and we should ask for people to do that because basically what we are doing really is we are simply kind of showing a mirror to what is happening. We're kind of bringing it into the light. We're kind of shining a bright light on what these people are doing you know, at the dead of night, in, in behind locked doors, inside hospitals, written down in company policies, using uh, the connection of police to um, engage in intimidation and threat situations, etc. And uh, psychiatrists, you know, literally being out of control here with their ridiculous diagnoses, which are destroying people's lives. Exactly. I'm sorry, but I think these psychiatrists have really opened up psychiatry for the entire world to look at. Yeah, and also they, we they cannot to, be allowed to steal people's children and take off in this fashion, you know, yeah. calling people delusional and then removing their children from their care. And I know that is actually happening elsewhere. And I know that child protective services in this country has a lot to answer for, but that kind of thing is happening here as well, you know, and it's yeah. happening in Europe, etc. There are so many issues with psychiatry. And to me, what this incident has shown really is that psychiatry is begging. It's begging for people like us to come forward and completely tear it down. Yeah, because they have gone criminal. They've got been, basically, it's the classical, classic sign of deep capture when, when a system goes criminal. And this is, this is amazing because this is, as you pointed out, a very high profile um, Brussels host. Brussels, this is the center of the EU. This place is swarming with you know, high profile people, diplomats or diplomats, we know diplomats might be actually be part of the criminal cartel, but that's a different story for another day. You know, so, but high officials, government officials, and this is one of the few hospitals here. So this is very high profile place, and yet psychiatry and the behavior of medical staff at hospital was shocking and more akin to criminal operation. But one of the key things in all this is, and as Millicent said, senior people might be using junior doctors as the fall people, as the fall guys, you know. What's very important is to record the names and actually put them, make them into a case study and record how they precisely behaved and study it, not under the light of anything as a medical procedure because it had no trace of a medical procedure or psychiatric procedure, but study it under the light of a criminal um, secret service procedure and an actual plan of warfare, 
a plan of modern generation warfare, which, as we're finding out, is the country's own military and intelligence agencies um, attacking the, the population itself, so attacking their own population. So this is a treasonous act. And everything I've seen points back right at Belgian intelligence headed by Jacques Reis. So I think I have, I have now witnessed a criminal operation run and authorized, must be by Jacques Reis, because if by now he doesn't know about us, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know he would be not up for his job. So I think this is what it is. But there are even more interesting, um, interesting points that I just would like to quickly mention before the, the show is over, because another thing that's a telltale sign of warfare is the truncation of the of the enemy's communication channels. That's number one, what you do in warfare. So taking Melanie's phone away in Hospital Brugman and not returning it to her in Hospital Erasmus is an act of warfare. It's a warfare technique. And when I was downstairs in emergency, I said, when is Melanie going? And I said it to a psychiatrist, the, the psychiatrist on duty down in the emergency section, I said, when is Melanie going to get her mobile phone um, back? Because I need to communicate with her. I need to find out where she is, how she is, and all that. As the accompanying person, that's my duty. And she said she will have her phone in half an hour. Now, that was a lie, because she didn't get her phone back in half an hour. She only got her phone back on Saturday, I think Saturday afternoon, after she requested it. And she says, you are violating one of my human rights. That's when they gave it back to her. So that was, again, a lie. And then later on in psychiatry, very interesting things happened. We were told that nobody had the right to see the child. That's also very interesting. Why put out a court order like that? Because seeing a child is not taking it away. You can see a child through a glass window. A, a nurse can hold it at a distance, you know. You can just see it. You can touch the child. Oh, I think Melan uh, Sorry, Millicent wants to say something. Her, her microphone was just off. And the, and the child needs human contact of loving people. They know the difference between strangers and family. The exactly. heart beats differently. But listen, I have just, I was, I was looking up something regarding uh, interrogation. This is a secret uh, document. Uh, it's entitled The Coercive Counterintelligence Interrogation of Resistance Sources. And here it says, all coercive techniques are designed to induce regression. As Hinkle notes in the physiological state of the interrogation subject, as it affects brain function. But now on down in here, it says, Meltzer, M-E-L-T-Z-E-R, observes, lengthy interrogations, the interrogator may, by virtue of his role as the sole supplier of satisfaction and punishment, to an importance of a parental figure in the prisoner's feeling and thinking. Who, and I'm, I'm looking for the name, who is Meltzer? Is that the name you're calling? That's is that, the, name? Is that, the, is that the, the last name of a doctor you're calling? Um, actually, yeah, actually, you know, uh, wasn't it, wasn't it, sorry, I'm sorry, I've just got, uh, we can't hear you, Catherine. Um, sorry, Melanie's just, yeah, um, so basically, um, I think also there was a Neil Smelser. He was the um, UN special rapporteur, uh, special rapporteur on to torture, um, replacing Juan Mendez. But I just wanted to um, finish off a couple of things, um, you know, very important um, about the actual things that unfolded. Because first of all, we were on Friday after we got after we got to know this traumatic information that was allowed to see the um, the child. The midwife came. And the midwife actually, um, she talked to us. And the midwife told me, now the new story, that the entire thing, and she said, oh, I think it was based on something I had said. And it turned out that the entire psychiatric hospitalization was due to me talking to the midwife. And the midwife then claimed that I had said to her about Melanie, that Melanie couldn't sleep the last couple of nights because she heard voices telling her that they're going to take the child away. Now, this was a complete change of the story. And the midwife, Elaine, who only gave her first name, took the, the, the bother of going up into psychiatry to tell us this. And I said to her, you know, 
Hang on, we were together. That's not what I said to you. I have never said such a thing because it's not true. I was talking about in general terms about you know my work and people in general being implanted and some of them being sent these messages through radio communication. First of all, I wasn't referring to Melanie. Second of all, I, it's not even true that she couldn't sleep because of um, you know voices in her head. It's not true, and it's true Melanie couldn't sleep, right? That's true, but it, I had brought it up because the nurse was really surprised that Melanie was just sleeping after the operation, and I knew it was because she'd been extremely, you know, tired. Um, and I and the, the nurse taking care of her wanted to reduce her pain um, painkillers, thinking, oh, she overdosed or something. I said, no, 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 don't don't cut it. She just she's just sleeping because she hasn't slept properly for three or four nights before. So I said to this nurse, where does this come from? It's totally wrong. And this nurse was very cheerful. She's like, oh, well, well, you know, I mean, this is my version of the events. And I just wrote it in my report. And yeah, and this is how it is. And I was like, oh, interesting. And this midwife claimed that she just finished her shift. This is the first time she hears about this. Very interesting facts, because the midwife story did not make any bit of sense. And she had already written a report about it. Hmm. There is no reason for a midwife to write a report about a conversation they had with the accompanying person. And it didn't fit her story because she even told us when she wrote, oh, I, have, I, I had you know, a day off. I wasn't even here. Today I came in into my shift and just by the by, I heard that they've taken the baby away. I'm so concerned. And then she comes and she finds us in psychiatry and tells us the story. This was nonsense. And also in this conversation, she received two phone calls. She claimed it's phone calls from her daughter who she has to pick up. But I'm sorry, when you're a midwife and you just caused a woman to lose her baby, you don't have really cheerful conversations with your daughter. You just says, I'm sorry, honey, I'll call you back. This is really important. But instead, she had really, you know, oh, we, oui, mon chéri, yes, of course, da, 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 da. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I was thinking, no, this is her handler calling. And this phone calls happened twice. And she was super cheerful. So that happened, and the entire story changed. And I thought, if you're basing all this on something I said, what has this got to do with Melanie? She was unconscious during that time. She wasn't even in the same room. This is even worse. So this is what happened. And then how come they, they can attest some morbid psychiatric disorder in Melanie, you know, based on what hearsay evidence and what I had said? So I immediately put it right. And I said, I'd never said such a thing right then and there. But then on, on Friday night, they still didn't change their story. So we did have no access. And then what was even, even worse is we visited um, uh, Melanie's father and I visited her in, on Saturday. And on Sunday, we visited her one more time. And then on Monday, we got to know that they had taken away the visitation rights. And no one was allowed to visit Melanie. And this was very key because what had happened through this procedure is they had set up a court hearing with a judge on Wednesday. And the story was no one is allowed to see the baby or Melanie until the court hearing. So why not? Why were Melanie's visitation rights removed? And I would say this is, again, another step of truncating communication channels. And imagine we are not allowed to see Melanie Monday and Tuesday. But on Monday, guess what? The, the midwife, who was there on Friday to explain her version of events, went and saw Melanie. So the other party is allowed to talk to Melanie. And, you know, she was really like, yes, but, you know, Catherine really said that. And she said that to me. And she said, you're hearing voices. So by the time I'm talking to Melanie, she's like, what were you telling this nurse? And I said, hang on a second. This is the woman who lied. She's lying. But they gave the other party who was making false statements and by Monday, she knew they were false because I told her herself on Friday. But she went there to reinforce it. And this is really to put, a, you know, take the other side and put a wedge, you know, communication wedge between the other side. That's classic information warfare. We are barred from seeing Melanie. I can't put my point across, but the other side is working Melanie, you know. So that was very interesting. But another interesting thing that happened on Saturday is, and every day had one of these wow, you know, days. On Saturday, I went in, and it was Melanie's father who said to me, Melanie seems strange. She is shaking. She seems physiologically changed. And then on Saturday, Melanie told me, she says, I'm sorry, I can't think straight, and I can't speak properly because they drugged me. 
and I just hit the roof. I said, what, when did they drug you? And she said, they started drugging me as soon as I was in hospital, Brogman. And I said, before the interview or after the interview? So she couldn't remember. So that's still not, not clear. Because I was thinking if they drug you before the interview, the interview is null and void, you know. But they drugged her against her will. And then when I heard that, I was like, Melanie, this is outrageous. Are they also drugging you here in um, Hospital Erasmus? And she said, yes, they are force medicating me. And they told me that they're either going to, um, you know, I either take the medication voluntarily or they will force inject it. So I, I took it voluntarily. So I, I hit the roof. I went straight to reception and I said, you are drugging a healthy woman. This is all based on a misunderstanding. You are drugging a healthy woman against her will. This is criminal. And I said, even Juan Mendes, the last special rapporteur on torture, thanks to Millicent, I know this information. She passed it. She, it was her research. You know, she passed it to me. And I said, according to the special rapporteur on torture, force medicating people and forcing them into confinement in psychiatry is torture. You are torturing a healthy woman. And I was just saying it over and over. And I was saying, this is criminal. This is criminal. You're torturing her. So I made such a fuss. They called the doctor. And this was, I think, Dr. Adraoui, Adraoui, or Ad Adraoui or something like that. I have to get the precise spelling right. And she came and talked to us. And in the end, she says, okay, you know, but it took a lot of work. She says, fine, we're going to stop the drugs. But there's other drugs you can take. And I even said, this is, you are drugging a woman who wants to breastfeed. I'm not even sure if these drugs are, you know, compatible with that. And she says, okay, okay, we've got an, we can stop these drugs. But there are other drugs she can take, you know, that are compatible with breastfeeding. And I said, no drugs. She doesn't need drugs. She's totally healthy. But this forcing of drugs onto her, this is insane. And even the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has already recognized. Yes, and, and, and Catherine, you did a brilliant thing. I'm so glad that you were able to take that information that Millicent has given you and actually produce it and let people know. Because you see, those are our only defenses in these kinds of situations where psychiatrists are being given such power and such authority over patients' lives. And, you know, we are all grateful to you, Catherine, for having spoken out and for having stood your ground and demanding that the, the, those drugs be stopped. Because, as you know, forced drugging is prevalent across the world. This is what psychiatrists are doing. This is what they are doing to people. They are forcing people to take these deadly drugs. And I think this is, this is again, another instance of criminal um, operations. Um, and, and people have to know that this is totally, totally against the law and against their rights. But you know, when you're in there, Melanie couldn't demand it herself. And even that is mad. Why can't a person enforce their own rights? They are taking your rights away. It is. And it sounds like, you know, it sounds like hospitals now have become such a danger zone. They've become a war zone. We have to hand people a booklet of their human rights and their patient rights before they enter a hospital, it seems, you know. And I think all of us who are actually working on the front lines here to question these institutions, we need to get a cognizant in a hurry with what our human rights are. And we need to be able to speak for ourselves and to advocate for ourselves and to advocate for our neighbors and our friends and our sisters and brothers, you know, because this is what for your human rights. When psychiatry steps forward and says, you have to take a drug, we decree, you know, we are the queens and kings of the world now. And we decree that you take these deadly drugs and get brain damage from those deadly drugs, you know, those neuroleptics and anti Yes, and I think that the key thing to also realize is that um, the other thing that also um, became um, you know, very clear is that we had this um, judicial um, hearing. And during the judicial hearing, um, it was decided, so the psychiatrist said that they haven't found any trace of a psychiatric disorder in Melanie. This was on Wednesday at the, you know, before the judge. So the judge immediately revoked the order and Melanie was free to go. Again, they didn't just let her go on Wednesday because, because of administration. So she only could go on Thursday. Thursday um, morning she was allowed to leave because apparently even though the psychiat a psychiatrists were present, the other party was present from Hospital Erasmus and this entire court hearing happened in Hospital Erasmus, apparently they still have to wait for the post. 
So they have to wait for the judge giving it officially in a post. Okay. So, but this is very important to realize because if they, they do something that traumatic to a woman and then later on they cannot find any trace of a psychiatric disease and they admit it, it means that they have been incompetent to start with. They have made incompetent decisions with devastating effects. But listen to this, the current status is that Melanie was free to go, but they are still keeping the baby. She's still, she's now healthy, she was free to go, but they're still keeping the baby, okay, that's the status. And then the other thing that's really important to note is that before checking out, Melanie was again told by the psychiatrist treating her that, and you know, there's a court order to keep the baby, I think, for 30 days. And already, before the 30 days are even up, before the 30 days have just about started, the psychiatrist still told Melanie that the hospital will apply for another 30 days. And you're telling that to a woman who's just about being discharged? Well, this is, again, psychological warfare. This isn't actually reasonable. It's not even reasonable in the legal sense. This is psychological warfare. And the other thing, they were humi trying to humiliate her to the last because then when she checked out, I went to, I was standing at reception with her and then her, you know, she was handed an, um, an envelope and in the envelope was a prescription for psychiatric drugs and a little transparent um, um, packet with several pills in there. And this is a woman who didn't take any drugs since Saturday because you all agreed she doesn't need them. And then on Wednesday, there's a court order that she's perfectly healthy. And then on Thursday, the psychiatric hospital gives her psychopharmaca and a prescription for them. I mean, these people have got, they are idiots. They're either idiotically incompetent or they're criminals. You know, this is criminal to prescribe somebody drugs who doesn't need it. I, it's unbelievable. So this is now the current status, and I've just seen we also, um, the time is up. Um, so really, we have to, um, you, you know. We should probably wind this up pretty soon. And I'm having major audio issues over here here because they're messing with my speaker so I can barely hear you. So if you can if you can ask Karen, um, Karen and Melison to make some final statements and then just pass it over to me and I'll close pretty quickly. Yeah. Well I, I will, will start by saying Catherine you, I, I agree with you that what's happening to Melanie is criminal but it is also malpractice and neglect. Don't forget that. Malpractice and medical neglect. Well, I also sat here thinking that the midwife could be charged with being delusional herself. I mean, she's either a pathological liar or she's delusional and unfit to hold her license. So if she said something happened and Melanie said, no, that didn't happen, then she changed her story and said something happened with you, Catherine, and you said, no, that didn't happen. Then you've got two witnesses against her that she is lying. So she is either a pathological liar or she's delusional and that makes her unfit to hold her license. So I would look into that as well. Absolutely. And, and you know, on the final note, exactly on this count, I can also say that all the psychiatrists who saw Melanie are also delusional because they, they deluded themselves and they had these delusional dreams of Melanie being, a, you know, basically just a, an out of her mind mad woman when Melanie was just sitting there perfectly calm explaining the truth that she had an implant removed from her throat and she had all the evidence on her laptop that this was the case. So these people are either totally delusional and absolutely schizophrenically out of their minds or they're criminals. criminals. Well, and they can have the, the, the challenge board. So you want to file a complaint with the medical review board regarding their, their treatment of, of Melanie. Exactly. That's an excellent point, Millicent. And in fact, file a major complaint naming every single doctor who was involved in this fiasco. You know, spell it out in a very clear report explaining what has transpired and point out the extremity of their negligence and their, um, you know, malpractice, really. Their criminal malpractice here, which is attempting to destroy a child's life and a mother's life. And, you know, I wanted to ask you a couple questions, actually, about that hearing before we close. One was, was that midwife present at the hearing? 
Sorry, just a second. I just had to um, go. Um, oh. The midwife wasn't present at the hearing. That's the okay. thing. The midwife was not present at the hearing. Um, that's very important because also to the point of the hearing, we were not given the other side's case. So they farm everything off you and they not give you any evidence or any documentation. We have not received, apart from this court order, we have not received Melanie's, uh, Me Melanie couldn't, it was not given any access to her own medical files. Um, she has not received any of the psychiatric reports, okay? None, see, we still don't know the midwife's full name. Absolutely no information was given. And the whole policy of this hospital was we don't give you any information as if you're, you're the patient and this is being done to you and you don't have a right to find out why. So this hospital and, and also the administrative procedure is utterly bizarre and it's based on maximum obfuscation. But one of the things I want to say just before I forget is that very important, I noticed that both Frederick Milson and also during the hearing there were two, the, um, a, a psychiatric doctor, um, Dr. Adroi, or however to pronounce his name, and another person was present at the hearing and the, the other person had again one of these cordless phones with her. You know, and as soon as the hearing was over, she jumped up and she, she had to call somebody and they left the room. So I followed them and she already dialed and she was about to talk to somebody. And I just said, excuse me, can I have your names? And, and she said, why? Why do you need this name? And I said, well, because you were just here before a judge. You're the other party before the judge. And I'm writing the protocol. So I need to know who was present at this meeting. And then this person said to me, you're not getting any names. We're not giving you any names. And the damage you've done to the hospital is already big enough. And I thought, what damage have I done? What damage have I done? Because I was just here. The only thing I made myself strong for is that Melanie's not given any drugs. So what, what's the damage? And of course, these people were referring to, to all the publicity. Because they still believe they can pull off whatever they like and their name doesn't appear. So when people are not willing to put their name to something, again, it's an indication that something criminal is happening. Absolutely. And, you know, the reason for the publicity, of course, is because we clicked into action and we put the news out there and many people came forward to help us and, you know, transmit this news around the world. Um, and Alfred Weber had that wonderful webinar on Sunday, I think, was it, uh, where we all spoke and Catherine, you you presented your whole the whole experience, etc. That was what you did for this hospital. You shone a light onto what they were doing. You were not creating damage. The damage was something they created for themselves, you know? So they merely have to face the consequences of their own actions now in the court of public awareness and public action, public um, thinking, because opinion, the court of public opinion. So people need to be informed. When crimes are committed, other people need to hear about them. You know, because it's only through our common consciousness and our collective humanity that we are going to defeat these horrific systems of crime that have entrenched themselves over time and that are now ensconced in our midst and simply lording it over all of us. You know, this right. is the empire pretty much. This is the empire. We are in a reign of terror being run by these people who have established themselves as authority, authority figures in our midst. And, you know, this reign of terror cannot hold. And uh, people who sit around caving in to the excesses of surveillance are taking the wrong tack here. The right tack is to expose the horrors of surveillance and expose the horrors of abuse that secrecy and covering up surveillance is permitting. Absolutely. And just as a final word, you know, I, I just want to thank everybody because you, um, you, Ramul, have put out the contact details of the hospital and people could make their opinions heard. I think also this hospital underestimated that actually Melanie is an internationally known figure. She's an internationally known human rights activist. So just mentioning her name and her case has just stirred up a lot of response around the world. And, you know, um, Melanie actually was told off and she was told, tell your friends to stop calling the hospital. And she said, well, I don't know who's calling. And by the way, I'm in psychiatry. I can't do anything. I, you know, you even wanted to take away my phone. Who do you want me to call, you know? But I think this really made a difference. And I just want to thank absolutely everybody who wrote an email or to made a phone call because I want you to know that these things have a huge effect. You know, sometimes it's just so easy, it's for free, and it just costs the time to write an email. But getting all these emails and making phone calls has a massive effect, actually. 
because it brings home to people just how many of us out there know about this. Ramola, I would also like to ask if you could put the uh, link to the petition, to my change.org petition, at maybe at the bottom of the podcast. It's entitled Stop False Diagnosis, Psychiatric Detention to Cover Illegal Human Experimentation and Military Training Resulting in Torture. Um, as of this week, we've gone over the thousand mark. But what I also discovered is oh, about 140 international signees, the number that shows up on the website. So really, we've got almost 1,200 signees. That's wonderful. Thank you for putting that uh, petition out there, Millicent, because all of this is raising awareness about the horrors of psychiatry and what it's doing to people, you know, how it's destroying people's lives. Wonderful, sane, whole, mentally sound, mentally whole people's lives. You know, it's destroying people's lives. Psychiatry has to be stopped. Psychiatry is just, it's not really um, an, uh, a branch of, it's most of psychiatry, it appears like, is not practicing as a branch of medicine, but is practicing as a branch of authoritarianism. And I think we as humans need to start challenging that and questioning that. You know, psychiatry needs to be on the stand here. We need to, we need to take them to court, really, in a sense. Um, so I just wanted to echo, actually, with Catherine, what you said, to thank everybody who's come forward and who's done something, who's responded to our calls for help and who made a phone call or, or wrote a letter or email, because as Catherine said, these things are very, very important. Even if you spend, you know, just five minutes and spend, write three lines, that's powerful because it suggests that there are people watching. There are humans around the world watching, caring, you know, we're just acting like normal humans and responding and advocating for each other. So these things count. So thank you so much. And uh, to me, as I said, it really brings home the need to, to create a huge media focus, a media spotlight on psychiatry. And I'm going to be working on that. And I know there are other journalists out there who are already working on this, and I'm going to try to work with some of them as well. And Millicent and I have recently talked about putting together a whole bunch of resources for, for those who are targeted, extrajudicially targeted, themselves in these kinds of situations very easily. So what do they do? When somebody sections you, what do you do? Or tries to section you, what do you do? And what request do you have later? You know, you don't have money for a lawyer. You're, you're suddenly stuck in a hospital. You're suddenly stuck in a psych ward. What do you do? Who do you go to for help? And what can you say? to get yourself out of there. So all of that information, we're going to try to work together. And, you know, we call on others to help us as well, because all of you have resources, letters from psychologists, general psychologists. Dr. Ben Collinson came forward recently to write a very nice letter for Melanie and also a general letter for all TIs. And I will post that on my website. Um, and I've sent some of the letters to, to Catherine. So we're going to share everything we get so other people may know of other resources like this. We're going to pull them all together. Um, Catherine, there's one more thing before I close I want to ask because we're sort of in a public space over here. But still, um, I'd like to have inf all of that information, the doctor's names, the court orders, um, everything that you can possibly give me because, you know, I have barely started to write about this. I put out those news re releases, but I actually want to cover it in um, a series of articles. Really appreciate all of that information. I will pass it to you and I also want people to know that the battle has only started because one of the things I need to stress is that child is still held by Hospital Erasmus. We still have no one now that Melanie is... Yes, and we should close because we should point out, we should keep the focus of that child right now. Exactly, and this is also what's so incredibly suspicious is why would you take a child away the day after birth, bar anybody from seeing the child, and then continue barring anybody from seeing the child and let them hide. And this is particularly, particularly explosive when the mother is an illegal implantation victim. So I can just guess after Hospital Erasmus has behaved what I consider to be extremely criminally, I suspect that they're behaving extremely criminally to the child. I, this, is my, this is my neutral assumption based on the past behavior. And I do remember when I second I that in that, I'm sorry, I just very quickly, I second that as a very serious concern of mine that they took the child away, not only to harm Melanie, but to do grievous harm to the child by implanting her. 
That would be frightful yeah, if that has truly happened, you know. All the child. I, it's kind of inexplicable. Have you? Did, did you get to take a picture of the baby when she was born? I did. I did take um, a picture of the baby. Yeah. The other thing is also Good. that they, they are also, you know, they are capable of swapping the baby and stuff like that. So, I any, know. you know, I anything know. is possible. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with the intelligence agencies, anything is not just possible. They just routinely do anything they want to. So um, that's just, that is basically what I'm op working on. Also, before I um, close, I just wanted to say that the entire thing is made up. You know, the original thing was that um, everybody was to descend down on me that they even dared to mention implants. Well, I'm sorry, we already have the evidence. We already talked on it on techno crime fighters. Even Melinda, I had a public show mostly about illegal implants and so on, and her implants and my implants. But also, um, you know, um, a, a very nice woman, Teresa, just drew uh, um, drew my attention today to the fact that just today, if I may share my screen as a finish. Um, the hospital Erasmus has just put something on their website as a press release. Here it says, Communiqué de Press, uh, here, 25th of October, sorry, that was yesterday. And this is diabetes implantation of, an, of a new type of a glucose catcher uh, in the service of endocrinology at Hospital Erasmus. So this is Hospital Erasmus advertising the implants, the medical implants that they put into people, right? This is, all, this is their own press release. So what this means is that Hospital Erasmus, out of all places, cannot possibly claim not to know about implants when they are implanting people for medical reasons. Exactly, and medical implants are well known, you know, in many fields, including cochlear implants for for deaf people, people who are hearing impaired. So it's ridiculous for psychiatrists to step forward and say when people talk about implants or thinking they're implanted, they're delusional. And you know, they're they're this is the other side of it, of course, is is the clandestine intelligence implantation of people, which needs to be sp spoken about openly, as I've said before. And you know, we are here to make that happen. Because nobody, if no one else is doing it, we are going to be doing it. So I think that's a huge project for us, but we're going to continue to be talking about implants, I think, in great yeah. detail moving forward, right? Um, yeah, so if you guys want to do some, any brief closing statements. My audio is being severely messed with, so every time you speak, I can barely hear what you're saying. So um, forgive me if I seem to be kind of speaking over you or something, because I don't intend to do that at all. I'm pretty. I'm pretty through. It's, it's been a great day, and, and obviously, though, it's a very concerning uh, subject, and we want to continue to keep the baby and the mother in prayer. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we ask others to keep thinking of the baby and sending that baby light and prayers and good thoughts. Um, the last that I heard when I last spoke to Melanie when she was in the ward, obviously not today, but yesterday, I think, um, I'd asked her if she'd had contact with the child in terms of finding out how the child was doing. And she told me that she could not even call down to the neonatal ward. She had to go through the nurses at, in the psychiatric ward, and they would have to call down to the neonatal. And each time they called down, it was sort of hit, of, hit or miss as to who answered the phone? So if you got a nice nurse at neonatal, she would give some information like, you know, oh, the baby's sleeping well and eating well. And uh, But if you got one of those curmudgeons, she would say, sorry, Melanie Richin? No, we cannot tell her anything. She, there's been a court order separate, keeping her separate from the baby, so we can't tell her anything. Can you, can you believe that? So this kind of stuff has been going cruelty. on. You know? Absolute cruelty, exactly. So, Karen, did you want to say anything at the end as we close? We had barely heard from you today. Okay. Well, there was a lot to say, and I had a lot to learn. Um, I'm just going to close with Ephesians 5.11. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. That's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. That needs to be part of our guiding light here. Catherine? I, I just want to say that um, everything that I've witnessed is... Um, but I, I recognize it as um, secret service torture techniques to break people's wills. I'm glad to say that um, with Melanie, it totally misfired. I think she came out and her and I, and both, they, they you know, even involved me. So this is a personal, you know, um, act of war against me as well, as far as I'm concerned. And all I can say is that um, if they wanted to pour petrol on the fire, they just have. 
So we will not rest until we get these criminals and we will not settle for the fall guys. We go to the top of the hospital and the campaign is still going. The email address for Johan Kipps of the head of the director of the hospital is still easily accessible. We will publish it and we will not rest until we have the kid back and we will check the child for implants. And if there's anything, a trace of nanotech in the child, we will find it and we will bring these people to justice. And Jacques Reyes, head of Belgian intelligence, has it coming as well. He's he's basically responsible for the warfare against Melanie for eight years now. And he has to um, answer um, charges of crimes against humanity. And uh, he will. Yes, he will. yes. These are crimes against humanity. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. Yes, the, the, the war that they have initiated, this, you know, war on, on humanity, taking children away, has just begun because humanity is not going to stand for it. We are not going to stand for it. We are going to speak up. We are going to advocate for each other. And we are going to take this case all the way to the end and make sure that, you know, it's resolved ac uh, correctly for the mother. Um, I also wanted to say that on the press release that I put out recently, I also put in the director of communications at the hospital, her information, her phone number and her email address. She is the director of, of uh, communications. So I guess it's accurate that we approach her and we express to her our feelings about what this hospital is doing to Amethyst Richen and Melanie Richen. So on that note, I want to thank everybody for watching, being with us, and um, you know, for all the moral support. I'm sorry we, we couldn't participate in the chat too much today. It was simply too intense, our conversation. Um, and you know, we'll continue to keep working on this and keep um, informing people about what's going on as the days go by. So thank you again, and we'll see you next Thursday, same time. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.